Barbados, 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 and the rest of the Caribbean. It is Sunday, March 24th, 7 p.m., and we are live. This is the Marcia Week Show, and we are coming to you live from Barbados. On the Marcia Week Show, we agitate, we motivate, we mobilize, we educate the people of Barbados, the Caribbean, Africa, everyone who is in the diaspora. This is your show. This is the show for you where there's agitation, there's education, there's mobili mobilization. Yes, right here on the Marcia Week Show. Welcome, welcome, welcome to everybody. We are excited. We are excited, people. And I came with one, with three, we, with four words to tell you. <laughs> we are not afraid. We are not afraid. That's that's what the, the leader of the opposition said yesterday at the march. Oh, my goodness. Wasn't that an awesome march we had yesterday? We can beat our chest. We can touch the chest. And we say we are not afraid. Barbados, that, that fear, we are, we're pulling off that fear. And we're coming out. Our numbers are increasing, people. We are not afraid. We are not afraid. Listen, I know you're home. I know you're home. Can you say it with me? Can you say it? You might be in the kitchen. You might be in your bed laying down, in the couch. I know some people put it up on their TV and you're watching it. But can you say, say it out of your mouth? Can you speak it out? We are not afraid. We are not afraid. We are not afraid. And you know what? You could be saying it and you feel a little fear. Because you're worried, you say, boy, if I speak out, I work for the government and this, and my family work for the government and all the different things that can happen. But the more you say it, the more you start to believe it. So you might be saying it afraid, you know. You might be feeling a little afraid, but as you say, the fear goes, right? So that's, that's our word tonight. We are not afraid. We are not afraid. We are not afraid. Come on, Barbadians, we are not afraid. Huh? Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. And anytime you feel fear, go back to the, the what happened in Parliament just the other day. Go back to what happened in Parliament. Look at uh, go back to what happened in Parliament with this one man, and there were 29 of them. And he stood up and addressed them without fear with such courage. And that's what's required for us to get our nation back. It is a boldness. It's a courage that is needed. Yeah. And you saw that picture on the screen there. Oh my goodness, a beautiful, the, the, all the placards and the colors. And these were Barbadians out on the street, not just sending WhatsApp messages. But they got dressed and they went out on the street and they, they were making a statement. We are not afraid. We are sending this message to the powers that be and we will not stop. We are not afraid and we will not stop. That is the message. So though we were criticized in Parliament by the Prime Minister, in Parliament, we still went out on Saturday because we are not afraid and we're not going to stop. Good night, everybody. Let me say welcome to all these wonderful people. You are the reason that I come on every night. David was on 552. Welcome, David. Born again. Welcome. Blessings to one and all. Rock, Rocket Red, come down, lift up. Yes. Rocket ready, count down, lift off. Galvez, I saw you yesterday. Hello, family. It's wonderful to be here with everyone. Yes, 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 yes. It is a family. When I saw people um, yesterday, it felt like a family, a family. And I want to take the time to thank everybody who donated. I haven't got the full count of what we, we collected yesterday, but let me tell you something just that love people came up and they just pressed something in my hand you know they brought those people they came prepared people brought envelopes and this is what we have to 
our leaders need to understand that this is a movement of the people of Barbados. They are paying for the marches. There is no company sponsoring this, these marches. You understand me? And that was the 10th march of this kind. We've had some others having to do with IDB tests and so on. But of this type of march, this is number 10 people. And we owe no one. You pay for it. Every march, you pay for it. Every roadside parliament, the people pay for it. And that's what we want our leaders to understand. This is a movement of the people and you can't stop it. You can't stop it. And we are not afraid. <laughs> We're not afraid. Oh my Lord. Uh, Ramim, good night. Ramim is asking everybody to like and share. And she says, greetings, loyal patriotic opposition. Apply the pressure. Awaken the lions, feed the sheep of the information, operation, rescue, and restore. BIM must prevail. All hands fall in line. Opposition, fall in line. That's what you say. Those of you who are just joining, I say opposition. You say fall in line. Opposition, fall in line. Yes, yes, yes. We didn't do that yes one yesterday. Erwin Nurse. Welcome, Marvin Allen. Welcome, Rose 511. Welcome. Yes, yes. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Aaron Hunt, welcome. CG, can I say something about this woman, CG? That she is the real deal. You hear me? She is the real deal. CG is the real deal. CG did those placards. I don't, I think some, I think Mark probably went and helped her a little bit. But those placards are done by CG right there at Unity Workers Union. She goes up and she spends hours doing those placards. And weren't they beautiful? Without the placards, the marches are not the same. And we do need help. And if you're an artist or you can write really well, um, calligraphy, they call it, um, you can write well. Um, not let like me crap to. <laughs> you please go up to um to unity workers anytime we're doing the march and we we ask for help we need help because we could make more banners we could, and we're going to need more placards because so many there are people there who didn't have any yesterday because we had more people than we normally have than we normally have yeah so cg thank you for what you do cecilia miller miller marcia blessings ub shepherd blessings not grand hey good night clive osborne good night landed eagle good night simone daniel how are you good night monica ince good night do people please share like and share like the like the show you're watching on facebook like it like on on youtube as well lucinda allen llewellyn i feel i saw you yesterday llewellyn i feel adg hasbra oh wonderful wonderful emerson bob Sanchez, oh my God, Patrick Green, how are you doing? Wonderful, Sir Alfred Benjamin, Yuseline King, Pete Way, oh wow, Stephen Jackman, so many of you tonight. I can't call everybody's name, but I really want to. Marlene Knight, Diana Rogers, James Medford, good night, good night, good night, good night, good night, just in time. <laughs> I like it. Angel Humble saying, we are not afraid. Yes, yes, yes. Let them know. Let the powers that be know that. Anthony Oliver, Jeanette. Oh, my Lord. Jeanette Callender, Easy D, my friend, my friend Easy D. Wonderful, wonderful. Victoria, Victoria's Queen, Sugar Cane. Oh, wow. Rocky, Rocky Rock. Yes, yes. Sandra Carter, good night. Sheila E., good night. Lucinda Allen, good night. Good night, my family. I want to call everybody's name, but time is going away from me. Kali B, good night. Pete Way, good night. Oh, my word. Oh, wow, guys. Zara Campbell, Emerson Bab. Yes. Oh, so many of you. And really, we just feel like a family. I feel, When we were in the... We, could, we didn't even want to leave. We didn't want to leave Rosalind Holder. 
we were there yesterday we didn't want to leave we were just sitting down and talking because we don't get to see each other so we were just talking 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 you know yes yes lucinda yesterday was a day to remember we are not afraid that was a past us <laughs> we are not afraid let me just go right into um marva hunt just just um, saying hello and dying a husband folks i feel like i feel like you're all in my family honestly um it feels that way when i meet you i get to shake your hand and look you in the eye and connect with you and i love to do that i love to do that thank you so much after every march i feel so hyped and i listen i hope you're not tired you know i hope you're not tired because we're just getting started we're just getting started i am hoping that you are not tired anybody out there tired i'm not tired i got a good sleep for today good rest today i'm rested making sure i'm eating right doing my exercise because we got work to do we have work to do we have to restore this country we have a lot to do in this country yeah so make sure that you're you you are not tired don't be tired don't be tired things are happening things are changing and you know you see that picture there that's the leader of the opposition right there in the center in the black shirt that mr rob thorn himself with the people right he joined the march right there with the people and that is what is what is wonderful we welcome we welcome those from the government you agree with what we're we're marching about come and join us those anyway whichever party you agree with what what is happening come and join us it, we are open you come and join us all right so you whatever party you're from you be, you believe in the dictator they believe in what we're marching about come and join us barbados belongs to all of us don't let anybody put you in a political corner and put up and put a little brand on you huh? and say you are this and you are that and therefore you stay there and you stay there uh-uh we're Barbadians to the core that's who we are you understand you know in school i'm going to play the anthem no i need to because mr murray coming on soon but in school we used to have a little chair that said we are you said we are Bajans, couldn't be prouder if you can hear us shout a little louder. We are Bajans, couldn't be prouder if you can hear us shout a little louder. We are Bajans, couldn't be prouder if you can hear us. And we would go up and up and up and listen. We need to do that chant one of these days because we need to affirm who we are and we need to let them we proud, we are Bajans. We are proud of being Bajans and we're not afraid. And and the, those are in charge. They need to be, they need to be afraid of that because we're not going to let them get away with anything. Oh my Lord, I am just excited. I am excited, excited, excited. And I'm chatting away. So let me go straight into the um right into the anthem into the anthem so we're going to play the anthem the national anthem because we do that every day
Yes, yes, yes. With him now on the people side, we have no doubts or fears. No doubts or fears. We are going to achieve what we have set out to do, and that is to get our country back. Wonderful. Now, um, tonight, wonderful people, we have Mr. Glyne Murray um, in the house with us, and we are so thrilled um, to, to have you. We did not have you last week because you wanted to hear the entire budget and because you're such a thorough person <laughs> uh, before you, uh, you comment on it but we're so happy to have you tonight mr murray how are you doing i'm good thank you very much and thanks for inviting me back to join you yes sir anytime because we know that when you come you you are coming with history and tonight you are going to talk to about uh, to us about the history of budgets because you you know you you are I don't want to say your age, but you're you're you are up there. <laughs> don't, don't, huh? don't apologize. I just don't need to apologize because I hear you now all this talk that Barbie is an aging society as though it's a, a, a problem, it's a sin, it's a fault. We are only aging and have been aged because we have invested in good health and nutrition and care over time. We are reaping the results of that now. So rather than turn it into a say as a problem and a handicap turn it into an asset and make the society benefit from it yes yes well you know well i'm i'm happy to have you on because we get all of that knowledge and we need that now people as we rebuild our country we need to rebuild that we have to go to the foundations and mr murray represents that um, so mr murray let me let me move out the way and let you go ahead and start to address the people and talk to them about the history of budgets. I'm ready with my notes, my, my pen and paper ready to go. Thank you very much. I hope I don't let you don't have to such a big builder. But um, <laughs> first of all, let me commend you on the team for the excellent showing you had um, yesterday and all those in the society who responded to your first class call and came to the fore to join you, who walked the walk and just talked talk the talk. Congratulations. And at some time, we will have to spend some time talking publicly about the leadership that you give behind the scenes, before the cameras, on the sidelines, and all aspects of the program that you really put your heart, soul, and entire being in it. And I'm glad to be, in some small way, to be associated with your, your magnificent effort. Again, congratulations. But um, ever since the budget last Wednesday, sorry, last Monday, I had been fielding questions, some personal stuff, what what were my impressions, what were my thoughts of the budget? And I like to go on more with thoughts and conclusions than impressions or, or feelings. And first of all, let me make sure I'm not an economist, but neither is the prime minister. I'm not an economist, but neither is the prime minister. So my views and my analysis are just as valid and grounded, at least as hers. And uh, I, I make that point because um, I'm going to go right back to the beginning. One of the reasons, when I was High Commissioner for Canada, in Canada, one of my pr proudest actions was be able to brag, especially to the envy of my CARICOM colleagues, that Barbados had not, had never ever defaulted on a loan. Mm -hmm. And people, people were, people thought it was unbelievable. They were like said they were envious, but. And that stemmed out of even when we were a colony, the colonial powers, the Barbadian, Barbadian the colonial powers were very, always very responsible in the finances, which led to our development, which led to our competitors being uh, more better infrastructure, et cetera, it, 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 as compared with the rest of the Caribbean. So we have a history of responsible financial management. So it's against that background then that I, I'm seeing what has been developing. And I, I have been following budgets in Barbados, as we know them from the time they first started under Prime Minister El Barrow. Not that there was no proper financial management then, there were, but it was a different format. And uh, I've, I've witnessed or followed closely most of the budgets in Barbados, as long as it was in Barbados, uh, as when I lived abroad. And I, if I were to sum up br briefly, what were my what, what is my conclusion? I will give you my conclusion. I'll tell you why I say so. I think yeah. it was easy. I think it was easy the worst budget 
I've ever heard presented in Barbados. Um, not only format, but content, structure, form follows function, and these things match, match, match to the outcome. Uh, I say so, I think it was even worse than uh, what we had seen coming from Minister of Finance, Chris Sinclair, who himself was not an economist, but who I know uh, did a master's, from, I recall, a master's in, political, in the political economy at KFL, which means he would have to have some kind of involved more understanding or practice or collision with economic principles and political and whatnot. But I think that um, if I were to uh, uh, sum up the budget, I would say it's, it was a ZR budget. You know, and let me tell you why I mean that. You, you know how when you when the when the when the ZR on the PSG vehicles are dragging the road, they're driving slowly, the, the conductor jumps out the road, run up a gap, bring down somebody, stops the bus up, grabs them. Anybody, virtually anybody you see that is alive, you try to get them into the ZR to get the fare. Right? So they wear the way this was put together, I, it was like a ZR. There was no sequence, structured thought and programming, not as we had been accustomed to from the days of Mr. Barrow. Uh, as a matter of fact, up until Mr. Chris Sinclair, for every budget, we used to have something apart from the budget. The budget was accompanied by a separate document called, I thought it was called, I think it was a National Economic and Social Report, which was, was a compilation of the statistics and facts and conclusions. Uh, which we'll gave you a, a, a global a picture, a comprehensive picture of the Bahrain economy and society. It was published out of the, the findings of the Government Statistical Service, which has, and for a long time, was one of the most highly respected services in Barbados, the Central Bank, and the, and the, and the, and the professional civil service in the government of Barbados. And that used to come out along with the budget. And if that, if that was late or not, there'd be a big hurrah uh, to throw, uh, to our, because it was it was it was the basis on which you were able to compare what was being said in the budget against the factual, uh, the the statistical um, uh, material presented by these authoritative sources. So that was very important. We had that, I think, every year until 2018, and that dis and, and that disappeared. So in the absence of that kind of um, empirical evidence or whatnot from some sources, how do I compare? what the Prime Minister said, what facts, what factors, what conclusions by authoritarian sources they compare her, her, her persons against as contained in the budget. There's nothing. Right, so I just have to go on what the Prime Minister says. Again, who said she's just like me, not the economist, but she's been involved in the last few years. But that is not enough right, to me. And I'm not saying so now. In March 2014, I wrote three Sorry, two columns in the sense in which I pointed out that the next Minister of Finance in Barbados must be and should be a professional, a trained economist. And that was on the basis of what I've seen um, Prime Minister Tom Adams, Prime Minister Bernard St. John, Prime, especially Prime Minister I'd have to go through in their, in their management of the economy. The economy today is not as it was in the 60s or 70s. It is fast, it's moving, it's a 24 economy. So it needs an appreciation from someone who's involved and what is happening as they happen and not having to depend on briefs and what people tell you. Because if you don't have the fundamental training in it, you, you have to rely too much on other people's conclusion or whatnot. You're not able to use any critical judgment on your own. So I'm saying then that when I have to listen to the Prime Minister's presentation this year, I, I, I ask one, two things. Where, where is the beef? That used to, the where is the beef is a, a popular slogan and saying that was used in the 19, around, around 1984 by a, a small Canadian company called Wendy's, a fast food chain, who was coming up against the McDonald's and the big chain chains of this world. And they were comparing the size of their hamburger uh, meat. To the, they were accusing the bigger people of giving you more bread, more bun than meat. And they have put out a very successful ad as where is the beef? So I ask myself, where is the beef in the budget? In the sense that at the end of it, do I feel, in keeping with the, with the Barbados Labour Party slogan, a better life for our people? Do I feel that we, we are anywhere back to having a better life? Are we better off than we were before? The, or, will, or will we be better off after the budget? And I'm not convinced that anything in it, in it, um, in it justifies that. And then to the Prime Minister says that 
everybody said that. I speak on the Barbarian economy, spoke out, normal service has been resumed. But if that is what represents normal service, I think Barbados are in for a, 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 long, a long rub. Because it, it lacks theme, structure, it lacks su supporting evidence, costings. Uh, one of the things that caught my eye and ear was the, the there were some proposals make for, uh, to make it easier to, and better take care of, of, of the senior citizens, when they, the prime minister said that they would give they would give tax breaks to people who set up nursing homes, etc. Laudable objective. But then it says to me, but what about the people who have to go in there? What about the people who have to pay to get the patients there? If you leave it all to the private sector, who are the ones whom she's appealing to the set these institutions, we'll have to pay prices which it is already care for senior citizens in Barbara is already very expensive. And if you do that, if you don't build in concessions, we've been allowances. We used to do it. We used to used to be at one time. We used to be able to rate house certain repairs for our house, uh, medical expenses as part of your a part of your you get allowances, etc. Because we, and they encourage people to repair their houses, etc. Look after themselves because they had more disposable income coming to them. That has been over the years eliminated because the IMF, the World Bank, and the IADB have for years been pressuring Barbados to reduce what they call as our over generous and over abundance entitlements, concessions here, a right off, uh, a wreath there to encourage people to stimulate the, the economy, stimulate certain and let people make a contribution by getting a benefit at the end. In the same way that companies that will get a tax break for the investment, I'm saying that we used to have it where persons like credit unions, solar water heaters and water would get right offs because it would stimulate the economy, more disposable income, encouraging jobs, encouraging economic activity. There's not, a, I think, so when you're going to prepare, if you're going to propose for senior citizens' homes and settlement, you have to be make it affordable for people to do it. And, 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 and there's, not, there's nothing in the budget that says it. But I think it is, and that reflects the fact that we're not really under an IMF budget and programming and whatnot. And the IMF, which is by no means an, a philanthropic organization that do things for the best of the country. It used, it used to be called the, the lender of last resort. You only go there when you are virtually on left beds, depending on, the, on your state and what you're looking for. We use in the 70s, if you use in the 60s, in the 70s, the 80s, to call it the international rich server, bailiff. So I am, I am, I am, I am not in the least bit um, impressed by the fact that we are satisfying all the requirement, meeting all the tests and moving stage because we are still on an IMF program, which is only concerned not about the development of Barbados and its people, but about about satisfying a certain growth statistical paper, nominal um, criteria, but it is not being reflected in the overall development and enhancement and betterment of the society as, as we as used to know it. So I think we, we, we are a long way from that. There's nothing in the budget that says that. We are, we are anywhere closer to that. I think too that the, the I think it was a, a it seemed a rush job to me. Uh, and I think it seemed that way to me because it seemed a lot of cohesion and structure, long-term thinking and effort. And I think it reflects the absence of the prime minister for so often and so long in the period uh, leading up to the budget. I know with uh, Prime Minister Arthur, Prime Minister Arthur, when they were leading up to the budget, they they virtually sequestered themselves mostly and devoted all their being, all their thoughts, all their creativity, all their skills, all their effort, because it took you. You were dealing with the economy of the country, and you had they had to be very precise, precise and clear of what your thoughts were. But if you were jetting back and forth around in the world, taking advice, it, 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 it's a different the rhythm, the scene, the tone, the structure are totally different. And therefore, I was very, I was very, very disappointed in, in that regard. And and I, I don't think that the and I'm very disappointed that the prime minister did not even spend a minute properly trying to explain or even try to explain away why she was out of the country for the estimates. Uh, again, I said I cannot recall any any other any other prime minister minister for not doing that. I think I think the country deserves a better 
it was just glossed over. I haven't really mentioned it at all. I think I think it's disrespectful to the country. I don't think we should let it go. That it can probably become a habit for the prime minister, this prime minister, or any other prime minister or minister for that in 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 the future. Um, so as we stand now, I think we are in need of further analysis based on substantive and substantial in information. Otherwise, we would just have we just be given opinions based on hunches and feelings and anecdotes and barbarous it, it, it should be should be real beyond real beyond that. The the even even say like the price the, the cost of living, nothing really has been done or has been stated as being done or in the works to seriously attack the cost of living. We should define an analysis is what makes or breaks the country. And I I I and I think that um in that regard I heard I, I it made me remember I was not surprised at that, that because I remember a couple of government ministers both said some weeks ago when there was talk about the prices were not falling, prices are still high. They are both said that prices are stabilized in Barbados. Fair enough, it might have been stabilized. But if you stabilize what is high, all it means is that when the stable is stabilized at high, it has not fallen, it has not been reduced, it has not been beneficial to person's pocket. So to say it's stabilized, and not fell, reduced, or was lessened. I thought I thought it was an, an empty boast, and 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 things that are that things that are could have done much better. Um, I I also want to say that there are a couple of um, measures in the budget that I like to commend the government on. I like to commend the government on its um, on its attempt to enhance the conditions for some of the public workers in Barbados. Uh, I say so because some of the things that they are that they are talked about are not new. Uh, for example, the flexi allowance is something that I had the honor to work on with as when I had day to day responsibility for military civil service. A flexi allowance is we realized you could not pay nurses or doctors or policemen or firemen or persons of category for the overtime they put in. So what we did was to pay them a certain sum of money per hour or per period. To at least enhance them, so give them some. It was a token effort. I'm glad to see that there's been a little. I'm glad to see that. Um, also, the question with the public workers tra traveling, the long way people traveling scheme where people can get uh, right um, interest free loans like every other like other categories of the public service. But I'm, I, I thought that with all to with all the talk of stress um, and and, and uh, near suicides and the, this fact that satisfaction in the civil service, I would have thought I would have heard that government would have used the opportunity to also enhance, strengthen something. I also had the pleasure of initiating something called the Employee Employee Assistance Program, mm -hmm. which was a program that allowed persons who they were who felt stressed out, want a break, had emotional problems, had problems with the family, they needed time, they could they, they were free to they didn't have to take anybody in their office or their organization. We set up an institute and uh, arranged with some professional counselors, psychologists, and whatnot. Um, who they all had to call and make the appointment, and the government will pay. I think it was the first three or four. I'd like to see that that should have been enhanced and broadened and, 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 and made it more possible for a person. I suspect there are lots of persons who could very well deal with that, deal with that kind of help in the stresses and strains of, of the society at the moment. And I, I also thought. Uh, Barb, I'm sorry they're not here. Barb say more. I see Barb is in the paper. They're talking about um, talking about better preparations for your pension. But once, 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 but once uh, inflation exists, there not there absolutely no degree. Uh, there no no guarantee unless you're absolutely filthy rich about these things. But I I would have thought though that uh, that 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 bar itself should have been advocating for the plight of the senior citizens in Barbados. I detect a, a, a degree as exemplified in the talk about, like I mentioned earlier, sir, we are an age society. Or you're making some people feel, feel almost unworthy of being alive, of having lived so long, having contributed, mm -hmm. and who are yet in a, being, a way to promote, promote Barbados at their contribution. They can help mentor. They can write, they can explain, they can talk about history. They have a role for persons because of the accumulated um, 
accumulated wisdom and experiences. We talk about going back to Africa. One of the strengths of the African societies and Oriental societies is the, is the reverence and respect and not to give it, not to give it to senior citizens their advice, their, their guidance. So you can't, you can't be, you can't be um, talking about denigrating, make them feel less, and then have the same effect. But I also want to mention the talk about the, the, the drift away from Barbados. Um, the, the lady opposition spoke about it in the budget. The exodus, it's more than exodus, it, it, it's a drive away from Barbados of the young, qualified, eager, enthusiastic, talented people. Uh, why, why, uh, and the Prime Minister talked about getting them to come back. I think it's more important to, before you can get them to come back, you have to know to get, get what we have to determine what made them go in the first place and seek to correct it. Yeah. Otherwise, we can't, uh, can't, uh, we can't be sure that we have any beneficial results. But that, I, I think I've probably around my time since then. Almost, if I'm almost there. If I am, I, I take a break then deal with any questions or any. Uh, any things that you want you yourself might want to raise yeah um you know M mr murray it, it's interesting um what you said there about um the budget and i remember um there was someone commenting and said that barbadians are accustomed to um to budgets and they would have heard um all of these you know various prime ministers or ministers of finance you know giving budgets and they they could tell that something was was wrong with this one a lot of people are saying um that this is an excellent analysis and that um and that the concept the the, the idea it's it's a zr budget they totally understand what what you're saying however easy d was saying that um there were some good points in the budget which you also acknowledge um and he said Oh, let me find his comment. He was talking about the housing, the housing projects. And he so said, on. he yes. said, oh, yes. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm actually embarrassed about housing in Barbados. Barbados has done such a tre tremendous job in giving public housing since the 1940s. A very simple, straightforward way where you, the government provide a scheme, you'd get a loan or give you money, you build and you repair. But from the time, like I said before, you had this convoluted, my mind, I like to think it's structured, linear, clear thoughts. But when you had to apply for, or you have to get a piece of land, which was given you, but then you pay for it out of the takings of, it was too complicated. And, and I saw it, it, it's a further representation that Barbados has abandoned its democratic socialist principle of providing certain basic things for society. We are, we are, we have been following what the private the private has been saying the private sector has to lead, but the private sector in Barbados has never led to the benefit of the entire society. The private sector, as its very nature, is capitalist, leads for the benefit of the of the business sector. That is their role. And we the government therefore has had over the past has had a clear enunciated activist role of getting involved in health, education, housing, transport and work, you know, from um Prime Minister Granley Adams, um nationalized transport in 1955 when the private concessioners want to impose their own care increase which he said the country could afford he, he nationalized it he intervened but to leave it at the behest of the imf and the the the, inter, the liberal the liberal financial system it, it, it's the abs it's the, it's the abandon your core principles of looking after the less privileged in barbers so i think we have to get back like I said, I at one time was totally against land tax. I didn't see why I was why why if I save more or what to buy a piece of land to build a house, I should then have to pay, it, pay on it when the government would not have helped me. But I've tempered that over time and saying I think I would pay, but I think seventy five percent of it should go towards providing a fund out of which to build houses right home for the lower. Barbados. Otherwise, Barbados is going to head for a social explosion. And we did in the 1930s. We have to satisfy that demand. And now the fast talking, sleek, glib, uh, highly glamorous activities, if they don't provide the basics, a man knows when he has a household, 
not through any advertising, but through the reality of getting the keys in the sand. And I think we have to do what we can, can through creative thinking, through deliberate policies by government, to get back back to that position. Yes. Um, you know, um, I, I'm seeing Mr. Franklin um, joining, and in this segment, um, we have another seven minutes, and we are just discussing, um, still discussing the budget. We're looking, uh, Mr. Franklin, on the structure of it, Mr. Murray did an excellent analysis um, of it and looking at the structure of it and the, the fact that there was a lack of supporting documents that would normally come with the budget. And he looked at other, um, you know, other budgets in the past and the, and the way it was delivered, that this was really, uh, really not up to scratch. He believed it was, uh, he, he likened it to a ZR van where, you know, the ZR, the conductor, is grabbing everybody and trying to throw in them inside the van, you know, to fill up the van. So he calls it the ZR budget, if people are enjoying that analogy. <laughs> um, I don't know, do you have any thoughts? And just some, some quick thoughts. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you very much and good evening, everyone. Um, when I, I came on and I saw this ZR budget and I said, but what are you talking about? Because I, can't, I didn't understand the analogy, I just saw the ZR budget. And I was saying, but usually ZR fellas could drive good. This driver can't drive. So I was saying, but now you understand what you mean when you said a ZR budget. Well, this driver came out there and she she was down, bouncing on people all over the place. She can't drive. This budget, so called, because it was done around the time you're supposed to do a budget. That is the only thing about this budget that you would, you would think, figure it is their budget. It was a ministerial statement the minister used, and a ministerial statement that was what it was. About what? I do not know. Because if you look at the estimates, the estimates determine that the government will have a deficit of um, expenditure over revenue. The budget is intended to fill that gap. There is nothing in the budget that I can tell you how to fill that gap, except that the Prime Minister said, over time there will be some increase in rates and stuff. No, you, you tell people in the budget what these rates will be. Because then people can plan. Companies can plan. Everybody can plan. But she's going to postpone it. And then when you try to fill that gap, let's say she do it six months down the road, she's going to tax you heavier when she can tax you over a 12 month period as opposed to a six month period when she bring actually this change in rates. So the budget was just a rant where somebody got up and made, made a lot of noise without understanding what she was doing. This was not a budget. People call it that because it happened at budget time. That is all that that, that budget was all about. She talked about giving um, concessions to um, nurses and teachers and whatever else. Again, these are not budgetary items. This is, and I think they can't work. So up to tonight, just because one of the reasons why I came on it, because I was speaking to some officers who said, well, how come we are not getting these same concessions? And I said, but nobody knows what these concessions are. They have not been, so, so even when she spoke about things, she, she gave you a big promise, but have not defined, spell out what these things that you're going to get will be like, like for instance um you're gonna have a senior constable what is your senior constable i remember as a boy growing up we had constables sergeant um, constables corporals and sergeants tom adams got rid of the post of corporal and extended the constable scale right up to sergeant so over time, you will go up and up and up, and you will reach your maximum just below sergeant. Now, if they make you a senior constable, a senior constable will, know, will have to be a sergeant because his next jump on the salary scale would be sergeant. So there is no, unless you decide, well, you're going to carry up, regrade the, the sergeants, then they wouldn't mind that because they don't, they don't make enough, at least for the work that they do, so if you're going to start the sergeant at a higher level and then you have a, a space inside there where you can have senior constable 
Well, yeah. them boys here, they don't call it corporal. It's a part of military organization anyhow. You know, come up with senior constable and get you two stripes then instead of um, instead of um, three. You know, but she has not uh, thought out oh, this logical conclusion. The same thing with nurses. You're going to give the nurses an extra six weeks vacation. That kind of thing. Um, but how, you, how are you going to achieve that? When no nurses sometimes can't get vacation because there are not enough nurses. So you have a situation where you're going to give the senior nurses now a, a, a further six weeks vacation, but you don't have anybody to fill in. Right now, you don't have enough people to fill in. People leave the polyclinics on a daily basis and go to work a second shift at the QAH because the QAH does not have enough arms up. Even with bringing in the people from over, the nurses think, from overseas, and, mm -hmm. and they have brought in nurses who who are not as well trained, who are not as qualified, who who have not passed the mandatory tests for um that you have sort of a Belgian could qualify to be a nurse in Barbados, but they haven't. But they're coming, and even in COVID, the border people couldn't even speak English, which is another thing. So the prime minister's policies are haphazard at best. They don't, they're not coherent. You don't seem to follow any logical conclusion. The lady needs to sit down, spend some time in Barbados, and decide, well, look, let me concentrate on Barbados for once. Because right now, she's not doing that. Yeah. And all this hairy, fairy nonsense that she's coming up with to make some people feel good. But these are just corn for the yard fowls. This is, this, these are not policies. I've, I've, I've told this guy only tonight. I said, I cannot explain anything to you because it, there is nothing one in writing and two there is i don't know exactly what the prime minister is talking about yeah. i don't think the prime minister knows what the prime minister is talking about in the budget so so when well, as, she, but as glenn said make it, his analogy for zr yeah. um is that they're trying to grabble everybody to, yeah, make, to get friends of them. all or uh, pull them in you know, so you're, you're, I, in I, agreement, you're in agreement with um, Mr. Murray. Thank you. Yes, so you much. know, I, I know that that Zeta thing. You know, I remember one day I was at a conference, in Barbados, they were party, and a Zeta man saw a, 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 a fellow. You know, he said, "But you're a dirty man. You put garbage in my my um my bus." The fellow said, "Me? I ain't put the garbage in your bus. You see me walking, coming along to the bus stop, and I had my garbage to put in the garbage can, and you come and take the garbage bags out of my hand and put them in the bus." So are you going to talk again to my girl can't let him because you support him in there? <laughs> well, well, well that, that, that is what, that's the analogy that is. So, so, so that is what, my son, I'd like to explain that, that, that came back to my that mind. Came because she's grabbling everything, even the garbage. She's putting everything in, that's it, Sarah. Mr. Murray, as we close out this segment, um, is there anything else that you want to yes. uh, share with I, us? Yes. Um, real quickly, um, real yes. quickly, um, because it's, we're going to talk about corruption in the prison um, with Kaz. Right, Go ahead. of course. But just quickly, I want to I want to record my objection and resistance to the budget being reduced to being online. This uh, the government's policy of putting everything online and not putting it anywhere people can sit down, buy, print, and really they just I I I may a proper understanding. We are want we are you want people to read, but I say you're discouraging. We used to have budgets. For you. They were printed. They were serialized in newspaper. You can buy a copy for the government printery. And people had a better understanding at their own pace rather than listen to the histrionics of a presentation. I think we have to go back to that, even though the IMF wants you to digitize everything so that their consultants can come and make more money out of digitizing Barbados. I think we need we need more but you know we need more printed doc versions of serious documents. But people spend their time analyzing properly. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, um, uh, before you before so Glenn goes, Marcia. Marcia. Well. Thank you mm. so much, Mister Mister um, yeah. Mister Murray. Yes, go ahead. Um, before Glenn before Glenn goes. goes, you know, um, Glenn, you remember this? Right. Yeah, I remember that. that. Was, this this was when you were in office. You you and Pearson Bellamy went about producing documents, all documents that. That were there left and nobody had them and you you created some historical documents this is one of them reporting local government for barbados this was like a project i think you and, and yeah, that's right. me, who that's was right. government printer at the time 
I brought it brought in revenue for the for the, I, I, the it did because I, I I bought I bought I bought I bought some of these. A report well, on the morning commission, all those I, I have one of those already as right. well. Because all of those things the printer we used to do. Yeah. And along with the budget, along with the laws and other kind of stuff. They decide that the printery, everything should be online. And so they, they don't even give the printery paper now. Some days you can't find toilet paper in the printery. And far less print, paper to print on. I went there to buy some axe because they want to do some training. And I had some people I want to train because I don't want to be doing this by myself all the time. So I want to get some people who I can trust to go out there and do what I do. You know, you got to bring us some young people. I went to get yeah. some axe. They had the paper to print them on. <laughs> I think that's a deliberate policy to discourage people from reading and have a proper understanding of government's policy, its shortnesses, its strengths, etc. I think it's, a it's part of a deliberate policy. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, um, uh, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Franklin, um, good to see you. Um, I know that this is a big issue, and you you have, you have dealt with this for you know a couple of times on the show. Um, but we're seeing in the newspaper today where uh, there are two, uh, two prison officers who are out on bail because they were arrested. And the allegation is that they have, um, that for stealing, that's the, the allegation that they have removed some of the property of the prison and, and brought it, you know, um, in their private dwelling. So, um, uh, you know, that has caused us to, to go back to this issue. And I know you've said to us time and time again that in there is a, a cesspool of corruption. That is corruption. I remember you saying that on the show. So can you delve into that for us tonight, Mr. Franklin? Yeah, well, this is an ongoing matter. You see, and the prison, you call it a cesspool, but cesspools don't get this dirty. Um, you get they get pumped off before they get this dirty. Right now, those two persons that we have there, they are the verbal tip of the iceberg. Mm. They are minor players in the whole scheme of things. I can uh, some time ago the, the lady that we were talking about in this scenario was responsible for, procure, for procurement. Okay. Yes. But. One of the officers previously who was responsible for procurement came to my office some years ago and he said to me, Mr. Franklin, these people want me to do things that I'm not comfortable with doing. What they asked me to do is wrong. I ain't doing it. I can't do it. And he objected to certain things, procuring certain things because they wanted people to buy car parts because there was a racket in the prison where people would bring in used cars, fix them up and sell them and None of the money went to the prison, but the prison money bought the parts. You see, so this is not this is not, and this is years ago, you know. This is nothing new. This is 2018 and, and, and beyond that I'm talking about. So this officer was not comfortable and he objected to the corruption. So rather than investigate the things that he was complaining about, they transferred him and put another person who managed to get a house. Out of the prison. I can take you up the road and show you the house. The um but at least the location of the house I understand it's a substantial property. I used to know I knew where the land was, but as a, that means there's a house on it now. That person has moved, I know this other person's gone in and they're gonna get their riches too. And but in the meantime, mm -hmm. prisoners are not being fed properly. It is cruel and inhuman punishment to put a prisoner in prison. Yes, he's a bad boy or a bad girl and this thing, but he is still a human being And at the end of things. And you can't treat human beings that way because nobody can treat snow like that because you've got to talk to me. And I, I remember it has reached such a stage where one officer, she's a, she cooks, turn up, there, uh, turn up in the prison, can't find flour to make bread for the men. You know what? This prison doesn't get any bread at night. She had to buy the fats and the flour to get to get bread. The prison or not to no bread. People they're ordering all kind of fancy stuff other than food for the prison. And when they all when they're ordering food, you will be surprised to see the cost of the food. Like for instance, cheese. A block of cheese coming. It would have been worth ninety dollars if you bought it in the supermarket. It costs yeah. $400 to the prison. That, that is one example of the... $400. So 
four hundred dollars plus, not exactly four hundred dollars, but in the supermarket, the similar amount of cheese will cost ninety. And that happens. So you, you, so when you have that kind of money being spent, and it, and you're not going, and mind you, the person can get cheese too regular. They get me. I had things like people making, um, what do you call it pig foot stew. I've had pig foot, but I had mine in sauce. Never had it in stew yet. Make that one kind of things with people in prison because they're using the prison money for everything other than what is supposed to be used. They buy the, as it to the parts when they they bought these parts. None of the parts fit a vehicle that was owned by the prison. Mm -hmm. They were then sold in um the present uh, uh, some prison officers even buy them and if they didn't buy them they didn't get the act and all kind of stuff in the present you know if you got you want to buy a car you want to buy a car other than what was available at the present you were in problems mm. you weren't you weren't a team player you, you weren't getting your thing these things i i want to ask the minister because he set up an inquiry at my behest if you, i told you i drafted the terms of reference for him don't make there cursing me and calling me, but my union. I I draft the terms of reference and I gave them to him, and that was the terms of reference that they use. Mm -hmm. However, rather than reveal what the corruption and nastiness that was going on in the prison, they said national security. Now we see where the national security is, because this new set of disclosures at the prison comes from a new person in the in the section who didn't know, who didn't know it's supposed to be hiding up these things so she calling the relevant people and that's where everything hit the fan wow. all right so if she had not spoken up or she was a team player i better say that person rather than she or whatever that person Mr. That Pankin, person somebody's asking which ministry runs the abrams the, ministry of home affairs ministry of home affairs so, and so what's happening there now, when you see things going on in the prison where people can get food, where and a lot of money spent, spent, but prisoners are fed, fed starvation, things and bad food. Some people who don't, who, who don't eat, um, certain things got to go without because they're not substitutes for what they don't, they don't eat because I might be Muslim and I don't eat pork and then got, mind you, don't got much pork in there anyhow. But um, I remember years ago when a certain superintendent complained, he said the people kill all the 15 or 18 pigs. I can't remember the number exactly. But those pigs had a grand total of three legs and two and four heads. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know when, when you accounted for them, the pig, those, those 15 or 18 pigs had three legs. And for heads, I would have loved to seen those, those um, animals walking about with their heads and things prior to being um, slaughtered. But that's what happens up there, you know. And the, so, the, so the meat was not going where it was supposed to go because the prison is supposed to provide provide food, food to def, to defray the cost of keeping the prisoners there. Right. No. Like so, and, and we have, for instance, now they're always finding things to do. Like right, right now, there's a move afoot to change the officer's uniform, but they got bolts of cloth to make uniforms in the prison, so you can throw them because somebody got a friend who got who decided this type of cloth or something. The prison needs a new minister, it new it needs a new superintendent because right now the, the last one has on and one is acting. You have officers coming in from the Barbados Defense Force. Who people believe that if you're a soldier, you could know everything. So you can put them in places that are paramilitary and they mess up as well. They don't know because they don't know the public service rules. They think they're still in the army. They come in and shout and treat people very badly. And of course, you didn't come to the prison to get shot at. You, you, when you're a soldier, you expect that because this is better thing you from recruiting. They come in there and, and they don't, and people who are in the prisons who are qualified can't get a, a, a promoted for whatever reason but you're bringing people over and over and over or the heads of people who are there and competent but this this is um there's another story for another time because that happens all over the place 
Because I'll, I'll, I'll give an example. At the airport, you can qualify to be chief of security because you had a certain amount of time in the army. But that same qualification, though, you cannot be a security officer one or two because so you can qualify to be chief, but you can't qualify to be one of your subordinates. So it happens all over the place, but the corruption is, is, is getting worse. And because for whatever reason, it, it seems as though, you know, it, government is, is seemingly corrupt. So it, it, the people follow the lead and they do these things and they feel they can get away with it because I can see it happening elsewhere. Right? But again, the prisons need not a Belgrave type inquiry because that was a show. You need one more like a forensic audit. You need the auditor general going in there and this time locking up people, giving people a change of not um, job um, from prison from prison officers to prisoner. You know, because the, the corruption up there is, is, is vile and rife. You 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 have people being promoted at the prison, not because of what they know, but because of their sexuality. And if you for instance, you had vacancies at the prison. Let's say there were 40 vacancies for promotion to the post of prison officer two or prison officer one. So anybody could apply, even people outside. If you're outside and you do not meet the qualification, then you wouldn't get an interview or you wouldn't be interviewed. But most likely, if they would, they would just take people from inside. People within the prison applied. Mm -hmm. More than 40 people applied. But when they sent the names down to put, to put what is so called personal administration division, it's now Ministry of Public Service, and they got all kinds of fancy names for it. I don't recall all of them right now. But then you always people so called PAD, personal administration division. When they sent the names down, they only sent down 40. So why are you going to interview 40 people to fill 40 posts when there are only 40 people? So that is the so those forty people got promoted. When these people got promoted, we heard, wait, how come I get an interview? When they check, your name never came down. You mm. up, you you are sending an application. Oh yes, I sent in an application, but the applications were not forwarded because you wanted a specific person or persons to get the job. No good. No, we have another system we put in the prison. You have. Prison officers working 12 hour shifts. They're only supposed to work eight. Mm. So every day that a prison officer works, except a favorite few who works eight till four and don't go anywhere near prisoners, you even have prison officers working from home. <laughs> Believe it or not, I don't know. You can. Yeah, we had prison, prison officers working from home. You're like, yeah. <laughs> I see you laughing. I am very serious. There were, you know, you had prison officers working from home. That's the corruption that is in the prison. But we have prisoners, prison officers, right, who work twelve hours without pay. I have been trying now for a couple of years to get these people paid the overtime, and they have not been doing so. They have not received the money. I've spoken to the Director General of the Public Service. I have talked to everybody. Now I'm hearing that there's a recommendation from the prison to pay those same officers who work four hours a day, every day extra, and you're saying, oh, we're going to get them eight hours a month for overtime. Now you have four hours a day, and the prison is proposing to pay those officers Four um, eight hours for an entire month. So when you had, let's say you worked twenty days, mm -hmm. so you worked twenty days by twelve. So which means that you have four, um, right. those twenty days you have four hours each day. You know, like eighty hours over time. Mm -hmm. But no, you want to give them instead of giving eighty hours for the whole month, you want to give them eight. And this and they, and they used the excuse of COVID and the part of the people working for these these things. They brought in more people. 
so that the people wouldn't have to work 12 hours. But yet still, the more people they brought in, they still have the people working um, for, for um, the, the 12 hour shifts and people are not getting remunerated for it. And, and they tell you they are getting tired because you leave home a morning to go to prison to work at seven o'clock, you know. Mm -hmm. So that means you gotta be out of your house about five. And then you work from seven a 12 hour shift. And then you gotta go home. Do your um duties at home, go wait for the bus if you have a bus, if you're lucky, you get a car. So you you are spending sixteen hours at work and, and transported to and from work. But then I got a lot of hours left in the day. You got children. You got a wife. Children will find themselves in mischief and then they might find themselves as one of the people that you gotta have of um take custody of right. if you don't if you're not there to guide your own children. Somebody else will take custody of your wife because you're not there to do what you're supposed to do. And but I try, I trust me, it has happened. I'm not going to call any names. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I have seen it even at the airport. They represented one fellow who went and drink rum and left the work because you know he, he he found out about it and he just walked off his job and was out to be shop drinking. That was another case for another time. So you're not paying these men. Also, the rules provide that when you're taking prisoners off the compound, you must. Have no less than two prison officers accompanying that per, that prisoner. But sometimes they don't have the manpower, so they break the rules and send one. And there's a little funny story here because um, one prisoner who was that one prison officer who was diabetic, he take, takes a prisoner to the hospital, and he had one of these, you know, pass up diabetic things. You know, you if you don't have enough sugar up, you yeah. you pass up. The prison officer passed up with the prisoner there, and the prisoner had to call the prison and tell him let the officer pass up what to do. Believe it, believe it or not, believe it or not. You know the prisoner, mind you, he got time off for good behavior as a result of that, though, because most other prisoners who were held bent would have finally gone and left you there, you know. But he called in the prison and tell him about the officer passed out. You know, Man, but, but, but they, they that, should take off some of his ears, <laughs> you know, that's nice. <laughs> he had to take off some of his time off for good behavior, you know. And but talking about time off for good behavior as well, this, what, there was this prison officer who refused to take off her pants when she was on duty. So they set her up. So they put a prisoner who was in prison for rape in the female quarters and left him there in the cupboard. And so when she come, when she turned up for work, he come out and tried something, but he didn't he didn't manage to do it. But she was traumatized. She had to go and see psychiatrists and all kind of stuff. The officer who put the prisoner in the prison in the, in the female quarters in the cupboard to hide out until he get promoted. The prisoner get time off for good behavior too. And the only body who suffered is the young lady and, and the Ministry of Home Affairs and everybody from Home Affairs down fought this girl tooth and nail to, 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 rather than pay her any compensation for all the injuries that, that, she, that she endured because she would not, she did not participate in the nastiness at the prison. Oh. The prison needs um, somebody coming in there with um, a bucket and scrub with some good clean dis good disinfectant and scrub it down. Well, that, that might be funny, but it really needs cleaning too. The prison was built on a spring. So sometimes they got some floors that are always wet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you got a lot of mold, a lot of fungus, and you have, and up to now it didn't finish construction yet because it, it didn't paint it yet. So officers get, and prisoners get a lot of sinus problems because they are in buildings that are not painted i one of my officers think he had to get surgery because of the the conditions up there because you you can and, and thing is these are these prisons weren't built for the tropics 
so they got so they got no proper ventilation i know that since airborne's attacked me i'm going to go for him he got on radio when they had the last i can't call it a breakout it was a walkout <laughs> when the fellow walked out the prison because another thing that happened there was a gen they had money to buy a generator and they didn't use the money for the generator. They then take the officers over time pay and bought a second hand generator. Yeah. They didn't pay the officers over time. Let's call it flexi, flex flexibility allowance. That's that just that means over time. So when you're police and, and the firemen and prison officers talking about the end flexi, they mean it's over time. They call it another fancy word. So they take the people flexi money and bought a second hand generator. Uh, when the power went off, the generator said, glug, 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 and stand. So they might have no power in the prison. The prison doors are open by um, electronic things. So the, the doors are open, the prison will walk out. So when you hear the minister getting there and saying, oh, no, those doors should be open at the same time, and there's going to be an investigation. You remember that? Yes. He didn't tell the people of Barbados that there couldn't have been an investigation because the doors open, because all the doors open. We got some really nice prisoners, only one left. And some of those doors had to be propped open because there was no electricity, so no air conditioning. Officers and prisoners sweltering. Then, of course, now there is the guy, Sean Hinkson. They have some inquiry into his death. Sean Hinkson's death is my slaughter at best. Sean Hinkson, remind us, yes. who, who is he again, please? He was the prisoner who died in his cell um, a year or more ago. Mm -hmm. He went, they took him to the medical unit. And he was clear, complaining of a pain in his stomach. They said nothing wrong with him, sent him back. Three occasions he, went, he complained about the medical unit. The Saturday before he, he died, he told them, I have blood in my mouth. The instruction for the medical unit was to, to the prison officer, give him some salt water and wash it in his mouth, and they put him back in the cells. But he's in the cell with some other prisoners, and during the night, he started to convulse, and he shook. And, and then he finished shaking. That was the last shake he ever had. He died. All of this time, the prison officers were on the outside listening to prisoners bang up the thing. But you haven't got enough prisoners on duty, so you cannot open the cells with one prison officer. Because you open the cells with a prison officer, fell out there, you know what can happen. So the prisoners, the prison officers, the outside, and they're banging. When they open the cell in the morning, Sean was dead. Man slaughter. Man slaughter. Airborne's not about it because they told him. You know, and because I didn't want it to be any national security issues or whatever else and stuff, I thought they would have done the decent thing. And the, and and one of the trade-offs that I got was that they will have the inquiry and they will go into this. And, and his coroner's inquest would have been done very quickly, but they covered up. They meant tell all the truth. They tell some of it, and Sean Hickson's family should sue the government over his death because, you know, it's not. It, I don't. I think he was a thief. And that's, they don't get death sentence for, for stealing, you know. But he suffered. He suffered um, the death because of the negligence, and but that's manslaughter. So there needs to be a, a, a lopping off of the head, that like prison, and bring people inside there. Mind you, you got to separate the heads from the prison while you're doing an inquiry. You cannot have an inquiry going on, and you have superintendents and, and assistant superintendents who can still control the men and tell them what they want what to say. We had the inquiry and then Abrams declares that because of national security issues, the um they're not going to make the report public. And some of it was dealing with all of these things I just tell you about. Except for Sean because he died after the, the inquiry. So Prison is, you call it cesspool, but cesspools don't get this dirty. You just clean them up first. This place needs cleaning. It need, and the thing is, it is known, but it is 
not known. I remember when Edmund Hinkson was minister responsible for the prisons. I was a consultant to the Prison Officers Association and the prison board, there's a board at the prison that makes recommendations and stuff. And they recommended that the prison officers should have a seat on the board, that they should recommend mm -hmm. a person on the board of the prison. And everybody outside of the prison officers felt good. But the officers came to me and said, Caswell, we don't know about industrial relations, you know, and we will go to these meetings and will just bamboozle us. We want you to be our nominee. They got back a letter from Ed Mason saying, no, we don't mean Caswell, we mean one of the prison officers, we want Caswell. So they then tried to take one of the prison officers and say, well, you are the professor, no. They even sent him this, this, this stipend for that month. He refused, as a matter of fact, he bought a check and gave it to me. It's still somewhere in one of my files. He said, they, they didn't want me. But they said that the prison, the prison officers association would nominate a person. They didn't say the person had to be a prison officer or he had to be male, female, none, but it could have been as well according to the cabinet. So then, so the prison officers never got a chance to, to have a representative on the prison board. Luckily for us, we had a case before the court saying that the 1982 amendments to the prison office, the prison act that said that prison officers can't join unions was it unconstitutional. I remember taking the prison officers for them to a lawyer. And I said to him, these things are unconstitutional. He said to me, Caswell, that case don't have any merit. I said, I don't want, I, I, am, I tell you, I don't want you to tell me that I didn't got the merit. I want you to argue this case, the case that I give you. Because win, lose, or draw, you can get paid. So just argue what he tell you. Anyhow, he went to court and argued what, what he told him. And he won, to his surprise. Of course, then he was both the best pastor up in the Senate talking about he have a good victory and all kind of thing. And telling the body that I so instruct him and that he didn't have any confidence in the case because he said he didn't have any merit. You know, and so no prison officers can join unions. But there's, there's a move afoot to stop them from joining unity. And even once once set up a new a, another type prison officer association because the prison officer association that they had in place. Oh, that money we used to go to the prison um, for some strange circumstances too. And I'm surprised that some of the people who had custody of that money didn't um, find, uh, end up as inmates, but they were protected and promoted, even though the. Um, the we have a situation now where a prison officer, of course, another one, curse him and Tell you the worst things in the world, and and this prison officer, senior prison officer, mind you, you cannot speak to a, a, a public servant like that. A senior can't speak to that. That is an offence. The prison will do nothing about it because this man is up for promotion. So if he get disciplined, so they refuse to bring the matter up, and this is months. They yeah. refuse to do it because they want to promote him. All yeah. kind of madness going on in the prison, and the prison has no guidance. The, let me go back to Edmund Hinkson. When we discovered that the, when, how we discovered that they took the money from the Flexi, the flexi over time and spent it on something else, we were told that by the permanent, that by the senior officers and the permanent secretary who was at the meeting said, no, you can't do that. That is wrong. She got to have an investigation. I can't remember her name now, but she, she had six months to go before she retired from the public service. But she was going out at a bit of buying because she was going to have an inquiry into the prison. They moved her immediately. You don't move somebody and put them in another ministry for six, the last six months of their career. Yeah. And I can tell you that you cannot transfer a prison officer, I mean, a, a, a head of department, permanent secretary, Without the Prime Minister say so. I am not saying that the Prime Minister knew where the water there transferred. All I'm saying is it's a coincidence that she's insisted that we're gonna have an investigation into 
can I pay the president money? And when she said, when she about to institute it, she got transferred. Yeah. You know, some, tra some, somebody here, Mr. Franklin, there's a question about that inquiry. And um, I tried to capture a couple of the questions. Um, Anderson Thompson was asking about what happened, what has happened to the inquiry of the prison and other government departments that was stated more than a year ago. Um, that, is that what you're referring to? Yes, that's what I'm referring to. Minister Abram, after the report was made, it was damning as far as I understand, and he said publicly that they had national security issues so they can't release the um, report. So, they may let the public know the nastiness that was going on in the present public was too nasty for release. So while he is out there worrying about me, everything is going to hell at the prison and he wouldn't go along with it. Yeah. I mean to hell, that is. Yeah, somebody's also saying that Pete Way was um, realizing that this is the same Minister Abrams that the GIS was um, under his care with a whole lot of stuff happening there um, and a lot of other areas in society that are just falling apart under abram's ministry and and wondering um you know wh why is that why 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 everything that he's around is it's almost like wh what's happening with him reverse midas he is incompetent in every area but the law and because it, it, and they say that because you can't say that a lawyer doesn't know any law because that's defamation so i'm not going to say that so i'm saying he's incompetent in every other way but the law and then we'll determine based on his record how good is that that too but there is nothing that he has ever touched that did, he didn't have that that reverse midas effect where you know midas turned everything to gold that he touched well right now they're going to put what he touched into water our water it turns to that stuff right. i i remember report complaining to him when you remember they had the when they said prison officers were missing and they couldn't find them and that kind yeah. of thing. You remember that? Yes. That was an absolute lie. Those prison officers were speaking to me at night. When, when they discovered that all oh, this COVID and the prison and thing, I said to them, go and get tested. And while they were at the, the place for testing, the best the Santos place. An announcement came on that all prison officers have to report to the prison to be tested. Mm -hmm. Well, they were already there sitting down waiting their turn. Turn to come next. They called me. I said, but you did the clinic everybody with medicines thing. So when they got the test, they were given instructions by a medical officer of health acting on the instructions of the chief medical officer to go home and stay home. Do not leave, don't go to work. So they then reported to the prison, called the, the um, duty manager and told the duty manager what transpired. And the superintendent said, no, he wanted them in the prison. The guy can't get tested. They were already tested by the same person that was going to the prison to test the other fellas. And they said to them, you know something? There are people that are trying to kill you here. Don't go up there. Because why they want you up there if you already tested? What they're going to do to you, they're going to lock the prison down as soon as you get in there, you can't come back out. And that is exactly what happened. And then they sent the police and said these people were missing. One of the officers, sister from overseas, called because his name was all over the internet and all kind of stuff, saying that he was corrupt. They knew where they were. They were home. When the police came to the house because they, they, they sent the police for them, I tell one fella, the police ain't gonna get going to get you. Just start coughing. You know, and before I know the COVID, the, the, the rife. So the fellow <coughs> police got me the house, you know. Police stop outside and wonder what to do. I tell them no, no thing. So eventually I negotiated with the minister that they will go to hotels. A separate rooms because you're not gonna mix them up with anybody else. Right. And they were, and they had, they went to a hotel. To show you that they were so hell bent on getting those fellas in the prison. 
you are you are claiming that these fellas back on the bus crawl and and the major they didn't go to bus crawl they were all three question men they didn't go but they're accusing them of going as bus crawl and now they went home and so they would have infected their their wives and family then they want to bring them to then then take the wife and families into custody like they want to take the prison officers so one officer, no, he figured, but since they're bringing everybody, he took his mother and his wife down. When they brought them to the hotel, they said, no, we don't want them. And they had to send them back home. Well, I, he didn't have any money. And I, I actually called the hotel and said, look, let the mother stay. I gave them my credit card number. The office, the, the, apparently the, the um, guest services person knew who I was. And he took the person, took my credit card. So the mother didn't have to go back home because there was no bus and they had that time they up the night and they didn't want to catch you back home. So I paid I paid for the night. I paid for the night for the day to stay because they didn't want her. They wanted these prison yeah. officers. And then the minister went on air and repeated the same things. I wrote yeah. to him and I said what he did was nasty. And I complained also because I had a spy in the prison. Who used to tell me what was happening? So when they had, when they were shutting off for COVID, they brought body bags. They didn't bring alcohol. They didn't bring disinfectant. They, bring that, they bought body bags. And this fellow, I got a message from him, and he told me, and I and I heard about it. I I, I spoke. I didn't tell him who, but the founder and they beat the crap out of him. He was a yeah. prisoner, and they beat the crap out of him and put him in segregation. But I couldn't see him. But of course, I had more than one person telling me so they let me know but my mind get beat up for this aggregation so i called abrams and i had to take you back out and i give him medical treatment all these things happen in prison and on abrams watch and he there criticizing right. other people and thing i'm and, 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 and making fun and estimates yeah, yeah, he got so much everything, everything he does is a mess well we, we are two two minutes uh more in this segment let me just ask mr murray mr murray any comments or questions from mr franklin yeah, what first is an observation. If I if his this situation that Caswell has been outlaying that the president had been so serious it'd be funny. It's probably something something going to laugh at all. It also reminds me of have you ever heard about the movie One Flew Over the Cocooness? Yes. That's yeah. right. That's a that's a that's a story of, that's a movie about inmates of an institution, uh, a mental institution. Taking over around the institution. It seems to me that the inmates are around the institution and the prison. Like I say, it's a hellhole for corruption. But where are the checks and balances? Where are the systems that have been used for time immemorial the Barbarian system, Barbarian public service to check and protect the public person, the integrity system? I remember we used to have in the Prime Minister's office uh, a, a, a counselor called Mr. Walcott. You must have known about Mr. Walcott, uh, Caswell. A first-class mm -hmm. man. Not even a quarter cent can get away from him. You need those serious, professional, dedicated person to ask questions. Remember the the uh, the institution that used to be that is down the corner hole, but where you where where, where, where does government? Central, it used to be central, central person. Central, uh, um, it's not the government procurement department though. So, so by, by, their, by their systems, their their local purchase orders, their their checks and balances for the system, if used, that can help minimize the effort. But so the prison is an institute unto itself, and nobody is buying the store, and it all has to go about their ministerial responsibility. That is what the law says. And, and they owe it to the public of Barbados to clean out that place and tell the public about it. That, that is that's a pep, happy court telling people everything. Everything in the prison cannot be national security. Can't. It is just and some work screen they're trying to develop. And I think you keep pressing the case and let the public support you, Caswell, in making sure that we... Because we had the, if all the institutions in Barbados were to start happening, like the prison, we'd be heading away out of Haiti. There'd be no functioning institution to all protect right. the society. Right. We cannot have it. Yeah. What's happening to the police? The nurses, and it was keep spreading this culture of corruption is an insidious evil that has to be stamped out by example, by leadership, and also by forces that are seeking to eradicate it. Yeah.
So it's a it's a lack of a lack of leadership, Barbados. This is Has what to be. this is what what it is, and it's very serious what Mr. Murray is saying, um, because look at what happened to Haiti. All those prisoners, um, you know, um, were were let out. Somebody, uh, I just want to read this comment, Mr. Franklin, before we move out of this um, this section here. Um, but I, I I took a picture of the comment because it's going so fast. They said. Janice Alexander says, I have a friend who has someone in the prison and she told me she had to send money for him because they don't give anything to eat at all. They sometimes get two spoonful of rice, no meat in the morning, tea with sugar and no milk. That prison is so bad. The old prison was much better than this new one. With the old prison, the family could have could take stuff for, the, for them and this one is different. Yeah, yeah, but um, someone was just agreeing with you about the treatment of. of yeah, I, 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 did, I didn't get, I didn't get to that part with the food, well, that was um, yeah, thing, but, but we might but, have yeah, to do it later right. another time. Yeah, that's what I was just saying that she's absolutely right. Yes, 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 yes. Well, um, uh, thank you, thank you so much. There was another, another comment here, um, Mr. Franklin, that I'm going to keep it. That's something we can talk about. Um, Simone Daniel 17 was saying that the prison was built over a spring in a, a, in a water scarce society, in a water water scarce in quotation country, but the prison was built over a spring. That's something I put it down as a note that we should we should we should um, have some kind of discussion about that because that that um, that is crazy. Well, I'm seeing Miss. Um, Ms. McLean um, here, and um, we just want to welcome her. Welcome Hello, her. Welcome. good evening to everybody. How are you? Uh, good, good, evening, Hi, good, evening, good, good evening, Good evening. Yes, and um, in this segment, we're going to be talking about pu public-private partnership, and again, again, Mr. Franklin on the whole project. So, um, Ms. Ms. Um, Ms. The McLean, hopeless. the hopeless project. <laughs> The hopeless project. That's what I what it, what we should have up there. So, Miss Miss McLean, yes. what 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 are your thoughts on this? The, what what what's on your mind with this public private partnership um, scenario right. here? Well, thanks thanks a lot, and good evening to everybody. Um, I know you've been very busy, and um, you know, but for me, as I listen to the discussion about this project and as i do my own research i mean I, I i think we've had the kind of investigation exploration analysis whatever of this project and from what i what i understand it is supposed to be some form of public private partnership and i ask myself what really um do we understand by it so i think for me, in order to, to really um, try to make sense, because the project itself right now as it is unfolding is, is as the young people say, make it make sense, because it, it seems to be so clouded and, com and, and, and confused that it, um, to my mind, defies the notion of a public-private partnership. And so I thought that rather than talk about these things, um, assuming that everybody understands I was what what these PPPs are? Let me say PPP because you know the alliteration might you 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 can get a little tongue twisted. So I'll call it a PPP. But you're talking really about a, a strategy of development of 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 design of getting projects off the ground where government collaborates with an entity, a private entity. It can be a private individual, a, a consortium of private companies and so on, but a non-government partner um, to, to deliver typically what are major infrastructural or, you know, long-term projects with long-term implications. For example, uh, one of the things that come to, comes to mind, the Prime Minister herself would have spoken um, recently about the um, public, the PPP as it relates to the, the, the Grantley Adams International Airport. Um, many would remember that she identified some partner in 
um, somebody out of the UAE, United Arab Emirates, um, yeah. as as one of the partners, and that is a that is one of these things. Now, basically, when you look at these partnerships, the the, the intention for a country like Barbados, which we can characterize as highly indebted, that is challenged fiscally in terms of you know finances, um, tax 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 revenues, and so on. Um, perhaps being inadequate, we talk about the deficits between the, the the budgeted expenditures and the kinds of programs that the government wants to deliver. Barbados, like many other countries in similar situations, have have used this model of of project development yeah. to fast pace, you know, um, such initiatives. So, so typically, it's, as I said, these are for large infrastructure projects power or energy, water, telecommunications, healthcare, transport, um, large infrastructure like hotels because we are heavily tourism dependent. Now, there are several models or modes um, for, for these PPPs. You can have where um, a, a partner will design and build a, a particular project. Let's say, um, the the we, for example, I passed it today because I, I was doing a bit of traveling with some farm, some family, some friends of mine. Family came in um, for a funeral, but we we took an opportunity to. So I passed the geriatric hospital under construction. I would have to go and revisit whether that is strictly government paying the bills or if they're partnering with somebody. Um, so you have that's one thing. So the design and build, um, and, and obviously if you design and build as a private partner, you are financing that whole exercise um now if you are then you have one, an option where they're operation and maintenance contracts um for example and and i i am i am not being definitive that this is the exact nature but i'll use as an illustration let's take a hotel something like like the, you know a, a major hotel in barbados the government might have financed its construction um certainly in the case of of the 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 what was Sam Lords, um, which is now the new um, window uh, right. that was constructed by money finance, a, a money borrowed by the government from the government of China, um, and of course you have a private entity, a, a brand, the Wyndham in this case, you have the Hilton, which is another brand. They operate, and I presume operate um, with an operation. And maintenance contracts, so they operate. They're doing running the business, and I, I'm not saying that this is it. I'm just you, I'm, let me just be clear that I'm not saying definitively either one or two of these would be exactly like this. But I'm saying the nature of their business would lend itself to such a partnership. I would yeah. have to confirm the full nature, or you may have something which goes even further. So you can see how the the PPP can become very complex. Design, build, finance, operate. Um, or they may build, own, and operate it, um, um, or they may finance it only. So basically, in, in all of those models, what I am really saying is that the government typically enters into these partnerships because they want to complete in, um, in an efficient and effective manner what okay. some projects which may require significant financial resources, which it does not have available or they may want to to access um, certain levels of innovation or technology which may not be readily available um, but there are a number of challenges that come with these things um, of course the more complex it becomes and the more stakeholders you have the more difficulty it might the more difficulties might arise the more difficult it might be in trying to to properly manage that and deliver the project the other thing to note about these because is that typically these are long-term um, projects. So you may find, an, a, 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 let's say, if you had a, 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 a operate and maintain, you may have a 20-year 20, 20 contract or something because okay. if, you know, a person may decide that, I mean, an entity, I, I'm coming in for the long-term, you know. Um, so, so in essence... Those are the kind, some of the options. Now, you could ask yourself, what's the rationale or what's the justification for such, such projects? And the idea is that hopefully, well, I hope Glenn, that this is not what happens. Sadly, it is, it is often, and, and let me say the word slowly because I, might, I love alliteration, people pilfering purposefully. 
um, and that's the, that's the downside because you also, as I said, there's some challenges. One of the challenges may very well be a situation where that happens. Now, um, there, as I said, there are a set of uh, reasons or justifications that countries or governments will give. They will tell you that it is perhaps an opportunity to get value for money. They see it as an opportunity to transfer risk from the from the public sector, from government and the people to the private partner. Um, as I said, there's an opportunity to bring innovation or skills and, and techniques and, and intellectual property that we don't have. Um, and to some um, bill operate, and, and that may, a bolt agreement may be on, will be on the probably a PPP. So that is one bill operate, um, um, I'm trying to remember exactly, but then the final thing is transfer. So you, so mm -hmm. you, 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 is that's that, that basically P2A is, is, is what one of the options. Now, there's an interesting element to this, and this is one of the things that concerns me because we ran into some trouble as a country with this, and this is it provides an opportunity for off balance sheet accounting. And when, when it, what, what in the context of government. Um, basically, a balance sheet carries two things, your, uh, uh, your assets and your liabilities. Now, if you have, um, uh, and remember I said that a PPP is typically used for, for high, what I would call capital intensive, for example, operate, or at least that's it, um, the build up, at least transfer. Um, basically, if it's off balance sheet, it it literally and figuratively, figuratively does not appear on the books of government. So, for example, when you would have heard between 2008 and the first couple of years that the government had to bring to book. So they had to, to bring into the records of the, the government's finances a number of transactions that had taken place, but which were not reflected um, in the books you heard about below the line accounting so it basically was off the book so imagine if you have a project that is 300 million dollars um half billion dollars 500 million or something and that does not appear on the books you do not have an accurate picture of the, the government's financial situation at a given point in time. Marcy, I know a little bit about accounting, so, um, <laughs> you know, so this, so this is part of the problem. Um, now, the, the question, and I'm going to say a couple more things, and then I'm going to ask myself or ask some questions. People picking people's pockets. We, we, have, to, we have to capture these PPPs, Marcy. <laughs> these are the downsides. Um, I, think, I think Mr. Griffith is very good at, at, at oh, this is Calvin helping out helping out Mr. Griffith with, with another PPP. Now, you have to ask yourself, what does government give in exchange? Because, I mean, these are business people in which you're engaging, and so there should be benefits for both parties. So, in essence, government, in terms of what it gets, it gets access to financing that it, it otherwise does not have or on the terms and conditions which are attractive and beneficial. It gets projects delivered um, quickly, efficiently, mm -hmm. um, within budget. And these are all theoretical because we can yeah. ask these questions in relation to, to this whole fiasco um, because as far as I'm concerned, it is long enough to recognize it as a fiasco. Um, so, so that's what government get, governments get. Government gets its projects delivered. On the other hand, it may engage in offering certain tax concessions um, for the entity, um, it may also give the, the entity partial ownership rights. Um, mm -hmm. uh, for example, tax concessions may be given where, you know, the, the company brings technology, innovation, its competencies, etc. So the idea is that the partners bring two things to gov together. Government gives access to a business opportunity. Yes. Um, and the private sector delivers um, to the um, to the, um, the 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 um, the government, the country, the government delivers to the yes. to citizens. Now, yeah. having defined that, because as I listen to the prime minister speak, as I listen 
and I did my research and I, but let's start back when, when, when we heard, um, when Kimar presented and, and over the, the life of this show, we had expansions and then we heard the leader of the opposition raise a number of issues. And then I heard the response and I will start with the prime minister's response because the prime minister was saying, because remember there was this issue of $60 million. Mm -hmm. And the first thing she said, and I, I will preface that by saying to explain is to expose. Mm -hmm. And what that exposed for me was the, the issue of what exactly is the project called Hope, run by Hope Inc. Is it a PPP? Because remember, government is lending this yeah. entity called Hope that has a, a slew of private persons as directors. And they said, in essence, it's a company. Even though I think they say government may be the sole shareholder or whatever. So I'm asking myself, please tell me and Barbadians, what exactly is that company within, you can look at it within the context of what constitutes a PPP. And mm -hmm. secondly, look at it within the context of what constitutes the, the, the establishment of companies on um, as state owned enterprises, you know, government has had several types of entities. So let us let us know exactly what is this animal called hope? What is it intended to do? What yeah. is the nature of the relationship between government and and the, the private persons listed there? And the question the, that's it. So in essence, the basic question I'm asking, tell me, is it a PPP? And if it is a PPP, what type of PPP is it? If it is a PPP, given the traditional notion that people will bring, you know, the private partners bring something very tangible to the relationship, what are those partners bringing? Because you're talking about housing development now. Remember innovation, are they bringing some innovative housing design? If so, is it something that you can sell to government? Because we had the National Housing Corporation that constructed houses. We have a construction sector, big and small, where particularly among some of the smaller players that are crying out for a business. Mm -hmm. You are looking to design. So are they bringing some new design that is radically cheaper or whatever? And we don't see evidence of that. So yeah. my question then is, what exactly is this? Because remember, we, we the government is, according to the prime minister, not me. When when people ask where is this sixty million, um, the the prime minister was quick to say in her wrap up that it was a loan. What are the terms and conditions of the loan? Now, if you are entering a PPP, typically, particularly for developing countries and and highly indebted and cash strapped country, countries like Barbados. You go looking for finance and you don't give your partner money. Mm -hmm, loan right. or otherwise. Because if you have that kind of money available, hmm. the question I would then ask, what other options could they use that would benefit a wider cross section of people? Because what you would notice so far, and I say so far from what I'm seeing with the designs that were made, um, that were being offered for the houses constructed, they were typically of limited design and probably utilizing less of the traditional labor that, that would have been used to construct my house where you had bricks and mortar and da da da, you know. So so that is one of the things. Now I've talked about the money, but the other element to the housing is land. Mm -hmm. You have given, and I if I hope I'm coping the leader of the opposition correctly, if I remember, I will have to go back to my notes, 478.2 acres of land would have been handed over mm -hmm. to this entity. That's a second major input. And so as um, the, oh Lord, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't read that name, that name. Anyhow, um, that's a long name, Marcy. The government could have done the project themselves. And that is one of the, if they brought the money in the lab. And mm. that, that is exactly what 
I was thinking, in, and this is what part of my questioning, my explanation was, and so on. So really and truly, the question for me, does this um, entity, this arrangement, this new initiative con qualify as a PPP? What type? I asked the question again, what exactly are the partners, did the partners bring? Who are the partners? We have, the thing about it, we have heard, um, they tell me that government is is the sole shareholder. I don't know. I would have to, to go. So there are a lot of questions that need to be asked. And for me, when I look at this whole situation, um, I am not seeing some of the expected benefits. We've heard about risk sharing, but the risk seems to have fallen in government's lap. We're hearing another expected benefit of a PPP is the efficient resource allocation. Show me where that has taken place. Um, you're talking about expertise and innovation. Show me what, where that is and the extent to which it is going to improve. Faster project implementation, well, that like it gone through the window. So far, that okay. is not job creation. Show us how many people have been employed um and and you know the the reduce fiscal pressure if it is going to reduce fiscal pressure why is government handing over 60 million dollars in the form of a loan according to prime minister and minister of finance motley um you know so so i really um and i'm gonna say this and, and pause i am really not convinced by my understanding and i'm gonna look for some documents i remember being taken through a short course as a minister on PPPs. Um, and, and, and at the end of the day, what I would want to say, I made a, I made a note of this because I went in search, I went in search of some um, information in relation to Barbados as such. Um, and I know that the prime minister has spoken about this. She's identified, um, in her 15-point economic strategy, I think, reported in the Barbados today of the 19th of March um, this year, uh, she spoke of, the Prime Minister spoke of increasing PPPs. Mm -hmm. And I would like for her to tell us some more because, and in order to do that, I believe that critical to the success, and this is part of the whole exposure that we had when I was a cabinet member, is that you, you need to have a clear set of policies on PPPs. In other words, as a government, what guides um, or what guidelines should there be in terms of your pursuit of such initiatives? What institutional framework do you have or should you put in place to establish clear procedures and processes for these projects? I am not sure that I can find it, but I really want to say, and I say this to the Prime Minister because, you know, I really don't get caught up a lot. I, I deal, I like to keep it simple. Yeah. And I, 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 I may talk a lot, but I also try to make sure people understand what I say. And I don't engage in fancy sound bites. As a teacher, I always, I always used to say to my students a couple of things. After they tell me something, my question was, so what? In other words, you have not properly explained to me. So you need to continue your explanation. Um, and at the end of the day, after all of the fancy talk and so on about these things, come back and show us the fine print. In yeah. this case, the fine print being exactly what is this that you've established? Why you have, you have established it? where we are and please prime minister you went to the same secondary school as me and i suspect that this lady may she she rests uh peacefully in eternity her name was flora jordan excellent ge geography teacher and she always used to say anyone with a grain of brain and an ounce of common sense would it, would understand or would expect or can do whatever and so i say to the prime minister the average virgin has a grain, a brain, and an ounce of common sense and can understand explanations that seek to give people something substantive and substantial to hold on to. I am not happy with what I've been hearing from you. And frankly, 
I don't like people talking to me in condescending manners. I think I think at the end of the day, we are entitled to proper explanations. Yeah. Barbados have been starved for proper explanations, and we need to get them. I think, Marcia, I've taken up almost the 30 minutes, but... <laughs> No, but, but Tom, it's a very important question. It's another angle to, to look at it because, um, you know, as you said, to, to explain is to expose. So if she's saying if, if it's a, you know, they've loaned their money, um, you know, is this a PPP? What what kind is, is it? Or what is it? What is hope? Um, Mr. Franklin, any thoughts before we, we move on? Yeah, you're muted, sir. Yeah, yeah. I was saying it was a PPP with a difference. Because people who come with the PPP, they come with finances, they come with money. And we give them either land or concessions or something. But the government is not in the habit of putting in money. Because if the government had the money to put in, you wouldn't need a partner. You would do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Just like they said at the airport that they don't have all the money to finance the airport. And they went and they got the people from Chile and Dubai. They come up with a consortium. And they were there are actually in control of the airport. All like, no, even before the thing was signed. Again, that I don't know what type of PPP that is because it, they negotiated the PPP after the fact. But government calls a lot of fancy terms. Hope that will go over your head. I I like I like Maxine, like things simple. Explain it to me. I will understand. I got that on your brain. And and but unfortunately. I, I suspect sometimes that the Prime Minister can't explain the things that she's talking about because she don't understand. She's That's given true. a brief and she does she reads it, but then there's a problem with analysis. So if you would look and see if a reporter tries to ask her a question, she snaps back because that was not in the brief for her to, to make. So I, I, I feel that there's some shortcoming there and, you know, we will always, we will suffer that that from that because the prime minister knows she's talking about simple as yeah. that yeah thank you mr franklin um mr murray any any thoughts or um on that or any questions from miss mclean um more of sub, uh, supporting buffer and casual trust um there are too many opportunities every opportunity to hide things away from the public you is right to have you have all these you have all these influences, you have all these programs, you have public affairs department, but still the people are getting less and less information. And I go back to something which uh, then advisor Porcel said be probably about three years ago. That they decide what they're gonna talk about and the rest they they, they ignore it and press on, ignoring the ignoring the uh, the, the furore and the controversy. Because there's no there's no strong commitment to let the public know. When last has there been a, a bona fide, good old fashioned press conference where a minister, including Prime Minister, takes down before a couple of people from the press and I asked it well researched, well grounded in the in the itself, and asked proper questions. No, all their sub subject to an occasional post cabinet press conference where they decide what they want to tell you about as been said by cabinet to make them look and sound good. And you're limited to what you can ask about. They're not because people come to these briefings not prepared because they don't know what to prepare for. I think we have, the, I, and if the press and Barbados had any decency, they would, go, they would demand, they would refuse to go to any more briefings or PR stunts. I said, we want press conferences on agreed terms, and this is what we'll do. These are the procedures, these are the steps we'll take, and so that people get information. Otherwise, you'll be just spinning top of mud and dog dancing and creating impressions when in truth for the public, the public are being starved. That's why I'm so afraid and objecting to all these online documents. 160 somebody pages tell tells what the budget is. Online, put it in print and let, let the government sell it to the public so people make it underline it, make the notes, call, call it up, tilt the leaves, and it's their property. You know, but you know, masters online documents that you can with a paper document in your hands. And I, I think we have to go back to some of the old basics, forget with all this high tech. Um, digitalization and, and whatnot, the basics in any field tell matter more. If you don't master the basics, you always end up end up end up end up suffering. I think we have to be aware we don't get caught up in the glitz and the glamour and the gimmicks and the 
so-called sophistication. But in truth, in the fact, we have to do things that suits our traditions, our culture, our habits, our level of education. Yes. And not just not just give people what songs popular because somebody from North America comes and said to you it through an institution or through some consultancy or whatever. Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Murray. Somebody, Calvin McKenzie, had said, speaking of all the corruption in government. One burning question is the Hyatt project and the Sam Lord's restoration, the Wyndham, subsidized um, by Barbadian taxpayers? As a question for Maxine, he says. So I guess he's. Uh, right. Okay, let me let me the, the, let me talk about the Wyndham. I don't the Hyatt is yet to be. That was opposed vehemently by David Comijon, Ambassador Comijon, um, who clearly has done an about face um so that but that still is that i need to say that but in relation to and i'll speak about i can only speak about what i know and i typically what happens in and i made reference earlier to to the hilton and the um um the hilton hotel the 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 government is not expected to subsidize i mean they would have constructed the properties and they have a management contract where payments are supposed to be made because these are supposed to be opportunities which, which have potential for gener to, to, to be um, financially profitable, to be profitable entities and monies are paid. I would have to go and look at the, 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 the reports of these things, but it is not intended to be subsidized. Um, it is intended to generate returns over the long term. Remember, I said a lot of these large infrastructural projects are long term. Um, and that is because if you build a hotel for X hundreds of millions of dollars, you, re you recover your investment over time. Um, because the, a government is not in the business of um, managing properties of that and moreover, their brands are important because they are talking about a, attracting an, an international um, clientele, you know, in the form of in tourists in the case of our hotels. Um, yeah. you, you, part, you enter a partnership with, with such entities. So I I don't expect that there's supposed to be subsidization, um, but I would have to check. And again, you would need to look at the particular contracts to see what the government signed off. And in the case of the Wyndham, while that started on the previous administration, the DLP started that. Um, it was completed and it, it opened on the new administration. I don't know. I can tell you, for example, when I sat in a place as a, a director of a bank, I saw the financing of a major project. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I don't think I am I'm, I'm going out, stepping out of bounds to say so. What I can tell you is, that that was the financing of the and you go in the press you would see this the judicial center and you know contracts were signed and so on and then you had a change in attorney general and contracts were then revisited that's how i would put it so mm -hmm. so i can't tell you and that happened on a single administration at the time um so i can't tell you what would apply now um in relation to the window now that it, it is complete and mm -hmm new um administration has taken over yeah okay thank you for that answer uh miss miss mclean um well um i know kimar is supposed to be joining those of you some of you you come on and you say where is kimar on sundays you know kimar speaks out you know he's a he's a speaker <laughs> and so he's at he's at uh i think i think I'm not sure if he's speaking there, but he's at a meeting tonight, and I can't remember where the meeting is at. And he's trying his best to come on. He wants to talk about um, at uh, um, talk about MTW. So hang on, he will be coming on. He told, he promised me he will be coming on um, tonight, and he told me exactly he's coming to expose um, some of the practices, what's happening, practices at the MTW and um, the sidelining of certain workers, um, types of workers at the MTW. So he's gonna, gonna talk about that. But um, Mr. Mr. Franklin, um, I know that, um, you know, Ms. McLean has given a class really, this is like a class, 
uh, about the PP. I learned a lot about it. And uh, my, I had a question for Mr. Kim, but I can't ask, I can't ask you now because we're going to cut into Caswell's time. But I wanted to know, you can always message me, uh, uh, you know, what, give me an example of, of, of an example of a PPP that has, is successful, that has gone through the stages and has worked for the people of Barbados. But, I can um, answer very quickly if you want right now so people can hear okay. one. Okay. Um, and it has also been, end, at the end, of, there was something called Bridgetown Cruise Terminals, Inc. And that was an arrangement between government as a shareholder and private sector. There were three categories of shareholders and their government. The the commercial sector, well, I would say um, businesses that operated in the port and shareholders like myself. Very efficiently run operation. The cruise terminal was when it was done it was one that, that was um used as a standard for other car car caricom you know caribbean port not only caribbean but caricom ports it re returned good dividends to all the shareholders government was the single largest shareholder um that came to an end in at the end of 2021 january 2022 government took it over um and since i've started to say that we are still waiting, we being the, the shareholders, on the final wrap-up. So that is an example. Yeah. Um, in fact, it's, it's a very good model um, that, that can be followed. So that's, that's, that's quick and short. So Thank I can expand on that later on somewhere. Thank and I could so also much. ask the chairman to talk to us as shareholders. Let me know what's happening. Yes, yes, yes. Interesting. Um, Mr. Mr. Um, Caswell, um, Franklin, sir. Um, no, I know you're taking this a uh, whole nother. Uh, you're taking this uh, a whole nother segment. We're talking about redundancy and unfair dismissal. And I say to people all the time, you're getting advice on the show. You're not a part of Caswell's union, but you're getting advice. <laughs> I said you get something and take some notes because if you're employed by anybody at all, you need to hear what Mr. Franklin is going to say right now. We have class tonight. Now Opa Ray Ray, we have class. All right, go ahead, Mr. Franklin. No, um, I, I don't mind. You know, people tell me, when I was a little boy, that knowledge is one of the few things that you can give away and still retain. So I don't mind sharing my knowledge with people because what happens, but a little bit I have, I, I, like, I share it with other people because sometimes when you don't have the knowledge, people take advantage of you. You know, and what caused me to decide on speaking about severance today because there was some issue in the newspaper about severance and um, in, the, in, the, in the press about severance for the people at, Barbados, I got a management company, and people were talking about oh, they get substantial sums of money. Severance pay is not substantial anymore. Under the original 1971 um, severance payments act, severance used to be four weeks' pay for each completed year of service with no maximum salary. To pay severance on so if you made a thousand dollars a day your severance was based on a thousand dollars a day if you made 25 cents a day your severance was better than 25 cents however in nine in um in the Johnny Tom Adams administration they decided that they will cut your severance at the maximal maximum insurable earnings for national insurance because some people are not aware that national insurance ensures your salary up to from january this year it's um one thousand two hundred one dollars a week or fifty or five thousand two hundred dollars a month i did not say seven thousand five hundred i said five thousand two hundred dollars i somehow this seven to five hours gets back to me and so so if you are making ten thousand dollars a month your severance pay your national insurance benefits whatever will be capped at that 
that level five thousand two hundred dollars it was not so until a change in um my time i didn't make that change and i didn't understand why to this day why it was done simply because national insurance would pay the severance pay for employers who did not have the money at the time to pay the severance pay that's why we had the severance payments fund and then the national insurance would seek to get back that money from the employer over time so the money is supposed to be paid but it's not that if you don't pay national insurance we pay that's the end of it so i don't understand why other than to save employers from paying out that money that's all it would have been but then worse yet but it remained at the four weeks pay for each computer your service just that you didn't know how you, 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 your maximum insurable earnings the Sandford administration back in 1991 then changed the formula from four weeks pay for each computer year service again i don't understand why to two and a half weeks for the first 10 years and then the next 10 years you will get three weeks pay for each computer year and then for the next 13 because severance is only paid for 33 years service anything over there is you don't get severance on it all right so for the first five for the first 10 you get two and a half weeks for the second 10 you get three weeks and then for the next 13 weeks you get 3.5 weeks of up to your maximum insurable earnings currently it is at twelve hundred and one dollars a week or monthly five thousand two hundred dollars mind you nobody will get and you get severance pay no and you are earning five thousand two hundred dollars or more you will not get severance payments at that level simply because you have to be earning that amount or more for two years 104 weeks and this only went up in january so nobody would qualify for the severance payment so right now under those um figures if you use them notwithstanding that you wouldn't get it right now yes. the maximum insurable earnings that you can get i mean the, the maximum severance that you can get would would be um hundred twenty thousand dollars one hundred twenty thousand seven hundred dollars but that's if you've been working for 33 years or more and you were earning five thousand two hundred dollars a month after two years mind you nobody will get it yet because you have not nobody has had that maximum insurable earnings by because it, you, it only went up to that in January. Okay. However, but in order to qualify for severance, you must first have been made redundant or laid off on short time for 13 weeks. Um, you're laid off or you've been made redundant one sorry redundant means the job no longer exists or that the, the work has diminished so much that it does there's no further need for you so so then there's no longer any need for you in the company or that the right. job no, the job no longer exists or they had a storm the place get blow away so you make redundant right. now if that happens or if they lay you off for 13 weeks a continuous period of 13 weeks or if they lay you off for 16 weeks in a six month period 26 week period then you can claim your severance pay or if you have been kept on short time for the same 13 weeks or 16 weeks in a six in a six month period then you can also claim severance pay now however if you've been laid off for 13 weeks and you have within that a four week period to write to the employer and say look you had me here on whatever terms you use as long as you convey the intention 
that you going to claim your servant's pay, right? And you give them one week's notice. Mm -hmm. However, if you have a contract that says you're going to get a month's notice, you're going to get a month's notice. But if you don't have that in your contract, it is one week. All right, so don't let the boy go out there and give boy one week notice when the contract says a month because then you would have lost your right to severance pay. Mm. All right, so if you have a contract that says you got to give a month's notice or a week's notice, you have to give to do that. Um, Mr. Franklin, can you just review for us um, uh, uh, um, when you can get that um, severance? You said um, if you will be made redundant. Right. If you if you remain redundant, a redundant she don't mean that the boss don't like you when he send you home. Mm -hmm. It means the job no longer exists, or that there's been a diminution in the work that, that you were employed to do. So yes. there's, that it, they can't reasonably keep you and pay you for doing nothing. So so that is redundancy. Or if you have been laid off or kept on short time for thirteen weeks. Or if you have been laid off or kept on short time for 16 weeks mm -hmm. in a six month period, because you know, sometimes if I can lay you off for four weeks and then take you back and lay you off another four. But right. if he does it now for 16 weeks, yes. you will claim, you can claim your severance pay. But okay. you have to notify him that you are claiming severance pay. Man, he's going to say, him, I mean, your employer. Mm -hmm. And But then, no, also, you just can't do it like that. You then have to terminate your own services. Mm. You wait and say, well, I, I terminate my services and I'm claiming my severance, my severance, my severance pay. All right. When you do so, you would register that letter to the employer. Don't care. And I had the secretary, don't do nothing. You register it and you take the registration slip from the post office. And you take that with you to the national insurance if the people don't pay you the money that if your, your servant pay. So if you don't get the servant pay, it will go before a tribunal. Nobody at national insurance can tell you you are not entitled to severance. They can only process the claim. The only the servant's payments tribunal can make that determination. All right. So I've heard I had a case recently where. And this is one of the reasons why he called because somebody national tell him, but you're not entitled to severance. I still tell the boy don't do no foolishness. Tell you to tell him to send the case before the tribunal. Yeah. The the person was then referred word to me when they were told that they're not entitled to severance. I made the noise. And then of course we had the severance pair, and thankfully I um was able to buy a ham. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I won that case. But they were told up front, you are not entitled to severance. You have a question there. You have a question Caswell, from Frank Was Griffin. the formula used for BIMC workers? Because I heard some figures from the minister that exceeding your calculations. I heard something about the fact that there was some hiding. I can get there. Don't, don't, don't. I can get there. Right? Because the, the I told you this maximum severance pay anybody can get, but the current figures, had they been working for 140, uh, 104 weeks at this level was $120,700, right? However, that's the max, that's the most you can get for severance pay. But when they're sending you home, they got to give you vacation pay. And if they didn't give you the adequate notice, then you have to pay you. For that pay in lieu of notice. Mm. And that pay in lieu of notice is they give you a, a, a formula or a, under the in the Employment Rights Act. Let me, just let me section twenty two. So I will find it for you quickly. Okay. Um it says the notice required to be given by an employer to terminate the employment the contract of employment of an hourly daily or weekly paid employee who has been continuously employed for one year or more is not less than a one week's notice for the period of continuous employment of the employee is two years two weeks notice where the period of continuous employment of the employee is two years or more but less than five five four weeks notice 
if it is five years service but less than 10. Six weeks notice if it is 10 years but less than 15 and 10 weeks notice if the period of continuous employment is 15 years or more. So you have to add that to the severance pay that you are getting as well. If you don't give them adequate notice, then you have to pay people their vacation pay. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you might get more money than what the severance payment thing said, but that is other entitlements that you have. Right, I got you. However, if you, the employer, does not conform to the the particular rules that we have, it is no longer severance. It becomes unfair dismissal. And the unfair dismissal is mm. you, you get more after nine years service. Mm -hmm. Because the formula doesn't go like two and a half weeks for the first 10 and three weeks for the next 10. It goes two and a half weeks for 10 years. And if you got more, more than 10, it is three weeks for that period, but less than 20. And then three and a half weeks from, for for um, 20 years of it. So you get all the time now. So it isn't a sliding scale anymore. Every time you go up, you get a higher level of payment. Right. So you get more for um, severance, um, for unfair dismissal than you would get if you were being paid severance pay. That's why you always hope that employers make the mistake and pay you and, and do it wrong so you can get um you can you can get more money for sap for um unfair for, dismissal for unfair dismissal all right yes. however when you let me get back to the thing after you give the four weeks notice you may you terminate your contract of service you know and you go to the severance payments tribunal now you have to go to the tribunal and the tribunal you have to present a case and and you have to these are the elements that the tribunal will take into consideration to prove that you are entitled to severance pay. First, I'm going to ask you what your name is. And they're going to ask you, how old are you? Because you can't get severance pay under 16 years of age or any, or any time you were working prior to 16 years of age does not count towards your severance. So if you start working at 14 and you um get fired something down the road those two years before you reach 16 don't count yeah. toward your severance pay oh. all right and if and, and you don't get pay severance after the national insurance pension age so that has gone up to 68 next and a little few years from now it will be 68 but right now it's 67. so if you are 67 years old and the employer send you home, you are not entitled to severance pay. You have to hope that he did it incorrectly, like the lady that he represented because she was 72 years old, and the employer fired her with no notice at all. Yeah. So that became unfair dismissal, even though she was over the national insurance age because the Employment Rights Act does not say that at any particular age that they age, can send home at. Right. You, you can, they can, if they send you home at 100 and they do it incorrectly, sure. they will have to pay a compensation right. for unfair dismissal. Yes. So, um, we, so that, that lady, she, haven't, uh, they thought, and employers somehow get mixed up and they thought that, oh, she's, she's 72 years old now, so we can just fire her like that and we're going to get you a sign and then she look, tomorrow's your last. No. Yeah. She, she had 18 years service. So she was entitled to 10 weeks pay, 10 weeks notice or 10 weeks pay in lieu of notice. And because you didn't give her notice, the dismissal became unfair. So then she got compensation for unfair dismissal. Then if it was if she was made redundant, but it couldn't make her redundant because the job was made. And you always got somebody to clean the house because people make people redundant instead of making people redundant. And then they hire somebody and call them something else. Mm -hmm. No, it is not what you call them. It is what you do. So if I am a cook and you call me sh a chef, you know, the functions of the job that I was doing still remain. So there's not a redundancy. So it is unfair dismissal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? But that, that came up in the... 
the law for um when it comes to and thanks to Barista Cool because she made these these differences because once you could have hired, fired a, a, some person for any reason or for none as long as you fired them within the terms of your contract. So if your contract said that you have to get four weeks notice, you get a fellow four weeks notice and you fire him, there was nothing you can do. But okay. now, if you have been working for one year, you no, know, unfair, uh, wrongful dismissal and severance, you have to have been working for 104 weeks, which is two years. Okay. But for un for unfair dismissal under the Employment Rights Act, it is one year. And I want to address something that the government is doing here with this thing is completely nasty. If you've been working for one year, then you can claim your rights under the Employment Rights Act. And one of those rights is that you cannot be dismissed um, for misconduct or performance. You can only be dismissed from, and you have to have a hearing yeah. or redundancy. And if it's redundancy, you have to show that you have to show that there's a real redundancy. Yeah. However, if but that applies if you have if you're sending home ten percent or some other substantial number of your employees, some substantial number. So it's ten percent or more. I remember I had a case where the employer sent home one woman. And I argued before the tribunal that that was unf unfair dismissal because he only had eight people in his workforce. Mm -hmm. So if you send home one, that's more than 10%. So he had to go through a process which would have required him to go through consultations with the worker, with her or her representative, or he or his representative, whatever. Mm -hmm. And... The consultations would commence about six weeks. That's section 31 of the Employment Rights Act. A 10% or some significant number rather, and rather than substantial, but significant. And you have to have those consultations and the consultations to start the six weeks prior to making the person or dismissing the person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? So, but if you don't do that, it becomes unfair dismissal as opposed to severance. Pay. And as I tell you, if you got more than the nine years, more, you get more money. So I prefer employers to do the wrong thing. Right. So okay. you get more money. So, Mr. Franklin, we're, we're, we're two minutes at 928 and I want to get Kimar in. So, mm -hmm. so we've established um, the, about the severance and the unfair dismissal and so on. How does that relate to to um to bam is that, uh, is that bmc 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 yes well i don't know this particular circumstances of it i know that there were th their jobs were made redundant now if you make a job redundant and the new then that person no longer works for you full stop however if and i don't understand why they did a redundancy in this case because there were um hiring back the people been in the short term under a new employer. The new employer could have taken their services over and said, well, and they will count their service not from the time the new employer start, but from the time they started working with the AMC. So there was no absolute need unless the people who were doing it didn't know the servants payments law because you don't have to make them. But I do I don't quarrel with that because the people got some money. <laughs> I, right. No, 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 no. I am very happy for them. You know, the because when you're working for a company, a company is a, a, a person in law. So you, so even if the person who owns the company change, you are still working for that company. So yeah. you will continue unless the new employer says, ah, 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 we buy and we, we bond buy from today and we ain't going back. Then the old employer got to give you servant spare mm -hmm. because that, and if they want to hire you back, then they can. But I don't understand why they did it this way. But as I said, Happy for the people who get the severance payments money because they could always find something to do with it. But there was no absolute yeah. need. There's one thing I want to complain about under the, the Employment Rights Act. 
um, you have to be employed for a year under that act to claim rights under that act. And we have a situation where the government at BRA, at, it is especially, they got other people, but especially at BRA and the QEH, they are giving you contracts and cutting you off just before you make the 12, the 12 months so that you won't be able to claim compensation for unfair dismissal. And then they hire back somebody new doing the same job. What it has done to these people is, is that that government is acting like a hooligan. Because one of the reasons why they have it for one year is because a lot of employers in Barbados used to hire people for 23 months and then fire them, especially lawyers. Hire them for 23 months and then fire them 23 months in two weeks or so and then fire you so you don't qualify for servant's pay. So then Saku, Saku brought it down to a year for unfair dismissal but now the government is hiring you for, for less than a year and hiring somebody else you might even get back a job something down the road but they don't so so government is making sure it keeping these people paupers yes. or keeping them mendicant keeping them begging the government for work it's especially at qbh and at bra you have people working at bra and you have them as cashiers. Now, if a cashier knows that I ain't, I, I, I ain't lost my job in the next couple of weeks and they're collecting so much money, they can them. some of them might be tempted to carry us some. Yeah. As have happened. Right? So when I joined the public service and you were a temporary officer, you were not allowed to touch the government's money because you didn't have anything to lose. Because you could have gone home in those days for one day's notice. So one day's notice, lot, that money would have been done at your house or something in yeah. some bank waiting for your thing. But now we have a lot of people who do not understand how the government service works and why. So you're going to get people and put them in a, as a temporary position, six months contracts at BRA. But worse yet, they allow them to join the medical plan and the pay contribution then for them. The, 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 you, Marcia, sometimes... People don't want to think I want to believe these stories, no, but they're true. Right. You believe you don't believe that people could treat others like that. You know? Um, it is 9.33 and I know Kimara won't get going. So some yeah. other little things that I, I missed, I can I can come yeah, back on another time and, yeah, but, and pick up on them. Yeah. But I want to hear Kimara. Yeah. But you know, you know. Th thanks, Mr. Mr. Franklin, and um, we, we definitely want to continue this. Um, continue this uh, tomorrow. Thank you so much, um, Kimar. Good evening. Uh, hi. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, hi. Thank good evening, Martin. Jasper, Glenn. Good night. Um, Welcome. Yes, thank you all the members of the loyal opposition. I'm very happy to be here. Sorry I'm late, but you know, a Sunday is usually where we have um, branch meetings. So I was also supporting the opposition leader um, again um, tonight. Um, ironically, we were in the Point St. Michael and we were right outside the Ministry of Transport and Works. Uh, tonight, I, I definitely wanted to address some things that are happening up there at MTW. And guess who again is the Minister of Transport and Works? <laughs> the the I mean, seven thousand five hundred dollars. <laughs> right? So so we were we were there because I muted. <laughs> really? Yes, yes. But we we yes, we were up there and um <clears throat> We saw some some people paving the road uh, outside. So when we were driving out, um, we had a bit of a delay because because we had paving crews and patching that part of the highway or say Parkinson School right onto the highway. Um, I am I let me see. I am very glad that something is being done about the roads in Barbados. Some people might say it's because of World Cup. That is fine. Some people may say, well, you know. So I, I'm just glad. I, I, I hear a complaint about the quality of the work, 
I hear the confidence about how long it will last. I, I'm just glad that the roads are being done in the way that it could. I just drive on a smooth road. I, I want to point out they only did roads when the Queen was coming to Barbados. And the road that the Queen would drive on, the government would patch that part of the road uh, or just for PRC. <clears throat> My challenge now is that you have or there seems to be a complete privatization of rural works in Barbados. I, I remember when uh, Glenn Clark was Minister of Transport and Works, and Glenn could attest to this, uh, where the MTW workers were the ones who were actually doing road works, repaving roads, and building new roads. But as time progressed, you now have private companies getting into road building. You heard Anderson Cherry complaining that he was not getting part of the action to do to, to build roads. Um, we, had, we heard conversations about Jada. We heard conversations about Carl Williams, Infra, all, all type of companies getting into road building, right? <clears throat> we had the company called Trieste. It is my scene that, that did the, the highway. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, that was Trieste. Well, that's a whole set of issues there. I have some documents I must go and look at them sometime and share them with you. Yes, yes. So you, you had a company called Trieste that rebuilt the highway. And, and, and as far back as the Barbies, the were party government between 1994 and 2008, and particularly that highway, ABC highway project, we had, a, it was it was so rife with, with, with corruption. And the way how the rebuilding of the highway was handled, and so many persons were accused of receiving kickbacks that time to the Ministry of Transport and Works. When the highway was rebuilt in Barbados, there was a plan to, to build what, what they were called flyovers or passovers, and the like. That never happened. Um, and since then, since then, Again, we started to see more private companies getting into what we call road building, road repairs, uh, whatever. Fast forward to 2024 now. Um, and the Century complained that during this Milan Pave program, two companies were getting majority of the contract. And he called them when right? The problem is you have an entire MTW department, people who work in the road paving department. There's a whole depot and the government is not giving them any work. None of the mill and pave program went through government's MTW. Right? Mm. So you, you took $30 million and you gave it to two companies and completely look past the government department that builds roads. Right? Mm. All of the crew MTW they're just sitting down, doing nothing. They collect a flat pay and they do nothing. All of the equipment, the trucks, everything are just sitting down in the depots. Government refused to repair them. Right? But they will go ahead and give companies these million dollar contracts because, again, it is very easy to issue contracts to people because corruption could be involved. There's a the possibility of kickbacks. Mm -hmm. Look, look what was happening in the Ministry of Transport and Works. Errol Clark and Associates writing checks to the Minister of Transport and Works. And at one point in time, he was receiving contracts to the Ministry of Transport and Works. Right? I don't believe Errol Clark and Associates is the only company that were writing checks to the Ministry of Transport and Works. Right? And if you look through what was happening and Particularly this Miller Pave program, we don't know, I don't know, but you, you know, usually when we have a hunch, something is definitely going on. But we need to ask if there were any other companies who were particularly benefiting from government contracts, writing checks to the Minister of Transport and Works in this country. Like, so, again, let's look at the fact that you're supposed to be spreading the economic pie. Two, two companies receiving all the contracts. Uh, we don't know if these 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 tenders, these, these things went out the tender. We, we don't know that. We don't know how the contracts were dispersed. 
Uh, in terms of allocation, whatever, if there was a procedure process, we don't know. So if the government had done what they promised with the IMF to do, and that was to put all public contracts in at Kaipo, we could have gone in there, we could have saw who were receiving contracts on the, through the Ministry of Transport and Works. We would have saw that Arrow Clark and Associates, the company that paid the $7,500 check to S. Bradshaw, we would have seen that arrangement as well. Right? So we don't know if there's a possibility of kickbacks happening right now based off what we're seeing because there's no way that you have an entire crew, a paving crew, a road patching crew. Some of the best work in Barbados was done with MTW workers. Right? I was even sad now is that all of the equipment at MTW is being taken over by UCAL. Wow. Right? Yeah. UCAL is, has taken over the garage at MTW. So all of that equipment that you see up there at the point, UCAL has now taken that over. Right? But but you didn't hear any announcement from the government. So I suspect that the MTW road paving crew they're going to be out of work. Because at no point in time did I see an MTW crew doing any of this patching work. I, I saw them painting the white lines in the road and the yellow lines. That is what I saw. Paint work. But as to the MTW road passion crew, which I know it does a lot of work because, as they say, uh, during that time when, when Glenn Clark was there, it did a lot of work. Right? There was still a lot of work going on in the Democrat Labour Party in some instances as well. <clears throat> right? So we need to carefully look. And we need to carefully study how this road paving thing is going on and why the government will completely sideswipe the Ministry of Transport and Works. $30 million, you know, worth of road work. And none of it is going through the government department. So wow. we want to we ask some questions here. How is this million pave thing being managed? I don't see any allocation in it, any estimates. So that means it's probably being managed off books. And 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 the whole project should tell us when the government moved things off books was usually happening. Oh. Hey. Kimar, I have a question for you. Um these workers, they are MTW workers, because I, I have had someone at that uh, before before this um program. Uh, Mill and Pave. Somebody had sent me that information, saying that a lot of the, a lot of times they're using private entities, um, and they're not using the NTW workers. I remember that being sent to me about three, four months ago, and um, my my question is though, would the would the government still be paying these workers? Who are just because he according to this this person who works there he said they're just sitting down looking they don't have anything to do uh, but are they wouldn't they still be be paid um just that question you could continue your, your presentation but they, they'll be paid a flat pay but usually when you do that paper you, you get uh but they were supposed to be getting a sewage allowance because a lot of these a lot of these road workers have to deal with things like dead animals and, and, and nasty water and, and those type of things as a part of the work. So there was a, a sewage sewage loss, hazard pay, and some other extra allowances that you get, incentives that you get as an MTW worker for doing that type of work. But you know what they did? They cut all of them. Mm -hmm. Right? So the workers are only getting flat pay, flat base salary. I see. Right? So, so sometimes these fellas go to work at 8 30 by 10 30 11 o'clock most of them back home because there's nothing to do there's no trucks to drive because all if not most of the trucks are just there parked the government is refusing to to, to pay for the repairs of the truck and as i said you somebody wants an explanation for what, for what is you cal i think cal will be better place to explain to the audience what is you cal better than me um but Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, UCAL is 
United Auto Works um, Cooperative, whatever limited. It was formed out of the mechanics okay. at Transport Board. We had a situation at Transport Board years ago where the Transport Board mechanics would come to work. There was a little shop outside Transport Board and they were going to play dominoes. During the day and at 4.30, they would go down inside and start working and get better over time. Okay. That was unsustainable. So rather than deal with the problem, Owen Arthur and Leroy Trotman came up with this system where they would get um, get rid of the um, mechanics and they created this as a cooperative. The first shareholder, the first actually um, president, didn't even qualify to be a shareholder, but they changed the rules so that Leroy Trotman could become the first share, share, mm -hmm. shareholder and president. And it has been ripping off the transport board for years. It is no longer sustainable doing ripping off the transport board and they have to diversify or dead. So the government, because this was their baby and they, this is a way to um, keep these people going because a lot of these people are members of the Barbers Workers Union and also owners because when you are a member of a co-op you own it but they don't have any say in the company they don't have any real rates they don't get any pay increases and if you drop it if you decide you're gonna drop it bwu they tell you you can lose your job at united commercial auto works limited it is somebody said government didn't know that your was going to take over the mega workshop and bw and government and government workshops Strangely, the unions have been silent. Well, the unions that, that have been silent would have been the, the um, Barbados Workers Union. But Leroy Trotman, he was only recently removed as president of UCAL. He was the first and president of UCAL, and he's been there from inception to about two years ago. The new president, no call help for Merrill. And, um, but it is, it is struggling. And the government is trying to keep UCAL on its feet. For whatever reason, I do not know. However, government is giving it contract work. Contrary from inception, contrary to financial rules, because when you're going to do uh, work, and that type of work, you have to put up tenders and see what's happening. There has never been a tender for UCAL work, I did transport, but I know it, even this. And this is this is a cooperative essentially a private business that government is now taking destroying the mtw workshop destroy any other workshops that i got to do mechanic work and putting the work at ucal for what reason i do not know i'm still at a loss as to understand why but that's i don't want to cut back into my time because it's time for 948 but i can yeah. talk about that another time yeah so yeah go ahead keep mark Yes, well, Kazu is correct. You, we have the issue here where, and you know, the last time we went to the to, to issue, uh, the whole project was revealed. This mill and pay pork, where as somebody asked what became the Anderson Church issue now, Th this is what I will say. If you have private interests openly competing or trying to negotiate with the government in public to be able to receive government contracts, Right, like our road building. They they are arguing for a portion of the somebody just said up there in between is thirty five million. They are arguing over thirty five million dollars that don't have any check or balance over it. Let me say that that million people for around has no check and balance over it. So nobody knows if the money is being paid out is being properly accounted for. Wow. Right, and. The fact that you have MTW, the government, the government entity that is supposed to be overseeing road works, and they are getting none of the work. What what what, what does that say? Should the minister, try, the deputy prime minister, come and answer that question? Why is MTW, who has a mandate, who's tasked to build roads, repair roads, fill potholes, so they have all the equipment there? But but you know what? They, I I don't know. They bought a three-year-old machine, or we call pothole patches. Oh. They went to real every day went to bring in 40, 40 pothole patches. That when the pothole patches got there, they probably only work for a week. 
and then they were broken down. The government just part them one side. So we need to find out <clears throat> how much the government is paying these private companies to be renting equipment. Ah. Because I heard happening right now at sanitation that they're, they're paying over about $23,000 a week for a bobcat. To rent a bobcat. Right? $23,000 a week for rental of a bobcat. Right? So if that is happening, imagine what they could be paying for these heavy duty equipment. But again, no check and balance, no financial reporting that we could be able to say, well, this happened, that happened. None of these things. And the Ministry of Transport and Works was given $142 million in this year's estimates. Along with another $30 million for the Olympia program. Right? So, as we recognize, we hope a lot of these side programs, they were giving the impression that the minister is running them. But it's not the minister is really running them, you know, it's the prime minister. But she would put the minister up front to give her an impression, not telling the public that most of these programs are actually run through her office. Right? And a lot of these monies are being paid out by, by verbal directors. Are the prime minister, the office of prime minister, right? The deputy prime minister is indeed right 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 up in there with the prime minister right and the rate at which this military program is being rolled out i suspect it has to be listed under the capital capital works program in the government which indeed means that the ministry of finance will have a big big role to play in it right and if not if we know sorry again referencing that whole situation when you have these large sums of money and then, and then you can have supporters of the Barbers the party because uh, uh, as Sir Cherry said it himself, he's a supporter of the government. He's a Barbers the party man. I have Barbers the party people openly arguing with, with each other in the public about government work that is not even supposed to be going to private companies. It's supposed to be going to MTW. Mm. Hey, so. This, that's another question for Miss seven thousand five hundred dollars. We want an audit, and we need some information on this million pay program. How much the government is paying out to be writing equipment from a lot of these private com companies to be able to do a lot of this work? When they will fix the equipment that belongs to MHW to get the, the the road crew back on the road and doing some of these roads and to run. These military programs like back to the estimates, back to government finances, mm. so that the people could be able to see, so that we can have accountability. But again, they run them off books and off budgets, and and then you have persons like me who have to go and dig and dig and dig to be able to bring factual information directly from the people. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Thank, thank, there's, you. There's, thank you, Kimar. There's <laughs> one thing I want to mention, though. Uh, Maxine will tell you. She dropped me home on there. And the only road in my neighborhood that in fix is mine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that is a coincidence or... Yeah, or before you... I know remember, you know, remember something. Uh, Speaking ahead. about road building, ha happening in St. Andrew, the, the Chinese, and another company called Complan mm. got the government borrowed four hundred million dollars from the Chinese that's in bank to be able to do roads and bridges and stuff in St. Andrew. No, the, the Chinese company Complan abandoned the project, or, 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 or they pretended to abandon the project. I think uh, because some person called them out, and then the government ran down there and they said they didn't abandon or whatever. Mm. But again. I am not, I don't have anything against anybody or anything, but people need to wake up. In Jamaica, the same company, Complan, that built the road and highway in Jamaica, 16 kilometers of that highway belongs to Complan, and Jamaica has to pay tolls to be able to drive on that road. That's true. If Barbados cannot, or find itself in a position that it cannot afford to pay for those road works, which are done by the Chinese Complan company, which should have been done by MTW in the first place. 
there is actually have to recoup the investment. There's no in, there's no investment from investment return on roads. Right? So Barbados and St. Andrew will end up in a situation where we now have to go and pay tolls to help repay the four hundred million dollars that the government gave to Complant to go and build roads. Well, NTW workers are saying they don't get nothing. Right? So but I I'll be speaking about that another time, right? But back over to you, Martha. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was no, but we were talking about my road. I wanted it fixed. Can okay, you go talk and build that thing for me? Because <laughs> you, you said you said you said that they were fixing road tonight when you went to this meeting. Yes, where it was said of Parkinson. Oh, jeez, on bright. Well, if you are listening, Mister Franklin needs his road fixed, so they fix everybody's road. He's saying, yeah, and, you know, and a lady passed, a lady it. passed alongside me in a car. And she stopped. She said, Caswell, you know, the reason why this world is fixed is you, you know. I've been going to get you from over here. <laughs> <laughs> so the neighbors believe that too. <laughs> oh, wow. well, we, we, we send it out tonight. We're sending it out tonight. <laughs> Folks, it's four minutes to ten. Four minutes to ten. And I want to use um, part of these four minutes to say to everybody, thank you for coming out on Saturday. We had an amazing time. I know Mr. Franklin came. He was a, it was a bit late because he had some other issues. But Kimar, can you tell us in a minute um, what can, you were you were all you were so happy on on Saturday? I saw <laughs> you you are normally you're a happy guy, but you were really you you were just beaming. What was going on on Saturday at the march for you? <laughs> Well, I, I was just happy to see the amount of people that were there. I was happy to see how happy everybody was. I, I, I didn't even get a placard. All the placards were gone by the time, by the time we got there. So I, I was happy for that. And really, people were jumping from the beginning to the end. The chat, I like the chant that Lumumba was saying. Uh, <laughs> one, two, three, four. Me and Molly out the door. <laughs> yeah, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, Lord, the people cannot wait. <laughs> Well, we yeah, have to yeah. give credit to Calvin. We have to give credit to Calvin McKenzie. He came up with one, two, three, four. Mia Motley, what again? Um, out the door. <laughs> out the door. Mia Motley, out the door. He came up with that. One, two, three, four. Mia Motley, out the door. And then on the morning, myself and Bunga Lights were talking. And we said, Mom, we need to put a five, six, seven, eight. And then he came up with, oh, Lord, the people cannot wait. And then um, I believe they're going to keep going counting the phone <laughs> 9, 10, 11, 12. So if somebody can come up with 9, 10, 11, 12, you can, right? So, um, yeah, go ahead, Kimar. That was a chat. <laughs> yeah, Marcel, so I, was, I was very happy to, to see that. Um, I was very glad that the opposition leader, Barbados, joined us on the march. I, I know a person, I, I can be fair, persons were asking, where is the DLP? We had march after march after march, and people were just asking, where is the DLP? Right? But no, the political leader, the Democratic Labour Party, has actually joined the march. So persons can't ask that question anymore. Right? And and he gave a speech right there in Independence Square, just below El Barrow statue. So I felt really proud, Mars. I, I felt really happy for the march to be sure. I felt really happy for the members of the loyal opposition. And I saw the way in which the members were so happy to be out there marching. And I said that if majority of Barbados did not have that fear and they had enough courage like all of us, we, we would have had a comfortable 20,000 people out there, but people are still very fearful of this administration because the victimization is very real. <clears throat> but I am very, very proud of everyone who came out, and I was extremely happy to see the opposition leader, Barbados, joining the march. And I think that that means well for the democracy in this country. Mm. Yes, yes. And somebody mentioned about the don't be afraid Afr uh, um, speech. We are not afraid. And we started out saying that at the beginning of the show. We are not afraid. And if they think we're done, we just succumb. Right? This is number, March number 10 that we've done in this in this series okay but we are not afraid we are not afraid that's how we started out i'm um, saying at the beginning of this show
coming from the leader of the opposition from his speech um as we close tonight um mr uh, murray what are your final thoughts to barbados i just like to uh, if i might add something to that to that ditty you were trying to finish off 9 10 11 12 put the whole bunch on the shelf I'm putting Thank it you. down. Put the whole, shell, put the whole bunch, the whole on, the bunch on the shelf. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what I'm saying to Barbados tonight. Shelf <laughs> them. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Murray. <laughs> no problem. Somebody want to know if the march will be on YouTube. It will, uh, will be on by Tuesday night. It is being edited at the moment and will be on by Tuesday, Tuesday night. Uh, Ms. McLean, what, what, what do you want to say um, to the people as we close, our wonderful people? Well, I will just say that I, I am convinced that we have to continue to unearth or to, to highlight because they were there. Unfortunately, um, these were not seen as things that the media should do. In fact, um, Today I was looking at an article that was submitted to two media houses and how how they are presented by different media houses. Um, we really have to continue to delve into these. And I, I, I Kimar spoke about the road construction, and we we heard about the thirty million, and that is a problem. But I will quickly say that I have some serious concerns about the 400 million. And I, I'll say why, because I personally would have participated in negotiations with the Chinese because the Chinese have this massive infrastructure fund. And in, in trying to encourage countries to borrow, a group of us from CARICOM got together and met with the Chinese to show them why the, the arrangement as they were looking at it, these large sums being borrowed in the way they were borrowed could very well be detrimental to our situation. And Kimar illustrated it. I will undertake to go and look for the specifics because I think that we talk about getting into debt trap and this particular kind of loan is one in which, because Bar Jamaica, I contrast Jamaica and Barbados. Barbados is 166 square miles. I don't know that putting a toll on, on, on roads in Barbados will really put a major burden on, on individual drivers and so on. When we think in terms of what's happening with the, the tax on fuel and, you know, to replace the road tax, that is a frightening um, possibility. I, don't, I haven't seen anything about it, but to even contemplate it would be madness, but there's an issue of that's a lot of money but I will, I will invest, well, I will pull it together from my perspective of what were some of the options that the government could have explored to, to, to try to access those funds. And if they weren't done in a way that would benefit us, they might have been better left where they were. But I, yeah. would, I would develop that by yeah, looking at the material that I have. Yeah, to look, to look, in, to look into that. Um, and so, um, Mr., I think Kimar said, um, said something already so mr franklin um let us close um tonight and what do you do to the wonderful people of barbados who um it was so good to see them you know um to see the people and all of your contributions your financial contributions have gone towards all of these marches you should be proud of yourself selves you know mr franklin 10 marches the roadside parliaments and they have paid the people of Barbados, you Barbados, you paid, you're paying for this movement. You're part of the movement. You're paying for it. No company is doing this, Mr. Franklin. It's the people of Barbados who, that are doing this. So um, over to you. What do you say to the people? Um, 9, 10, 11, 12, put them on the shelf. I know a shelf in St. Philip. Um, I could arrange something for them. I know. I, I am happy, Marcia. I'm really happy. I remember when we started this series, you know, um, they were saying there got a few people out there. And, but it was like a stream, like a, um, a, a river, you know. The river don't start out flowing fast, you know. When it gets down to the sea, you've got a whole set of water, but up in the yeah. hills coming down, you have a little tributary here and a little tributary running in there, and eventually it builds up to a big river. We are becoming a river now. 
and I'm grateful to the people who have supported us. I, I've, I saw people there that I saw on the first march and they're still supporting us because they believe in what we are doing. I wouldn't be here, Marcy wouldn't be here, Glenn wouldn't be here, Kimar wouldn't be here, Maxine wouldn't be here, Freddie wouldn't be here if we didn't have a commitment to the people of Barbados. And as long as we are seeing wrongdoing, we will continue. Mm -hmm. I, I, we are, none of us are mad. I'm the closest. <laughs> and, but I will not go out there and criticize people for doing the right thing. All this government has to do is do the wrong thing. And you can see how, how many things I have been talking about. So that, that shows you that how many wrong things that are going on. And I am scratching the surface. So we need you to come out there and to hold this government to account. And I was grateful when I got to the to the um, Independent Square because I said I was I had to go, an appointment that I couldn't avoid, and I made it my business to come down there. I was even on the truck dancing. This is the first time I danced publicly in sixty five years. <laughs> we're gonna play your song. We're gonna play your song. I saw Mr. Franklin doing a jig. Right? Well, I said, go ahead. Well, that's the, that's the first time I've danced in six, uh, public in sixty five years. I, I I but you know I got I was happy the crowd had me going and the jig was good. That's him as it become contagious or what? Yes, Max. I learned a few moves from you. <laughs> Listen, let, let, um, Dave, Dave, put up the jig. Put put up that little song and tell it. Young people are something else, you know. Young people, that's the thing. Creative, um, creative. Very creative. Well, thanks to everybody for joining. We're going to play the little song in a couple seconds before we go. Hopefully, we can get it up on the screen. And um, before you go tonight, and um, thank you all for um, joining. We're going to be on again tomorrow night, tomorrow night at um, 7 o'clock. Uh, and uh, Dr. Ferdinand is going to be on. And I know that it's going to be quite, quite um, exciting. And um, he's going to moderate, and I'll come on in the app, you know, after eight o'clock. And we have a great show lined up for you again. It's education, it's agitation, it's motivation, it's it's everything. All right. And um, I, I, I trust that you would have gotten something from this tonight. <laughs> Let me stop talking, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Murray. Hot off the press, Mr. Murray. This is the boss. This is your boss. Yes, to be good at maths nor English. I just pretending to care about people. I'm pretending to be good at maths nor English. I just pretending to care about people. Good at maths nor English. 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 Pretending to be good. I pretending to be good. 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 Pretending to be good. I pretend. Yeah, it has stopped. It not, is it working? I just yeah. pretending to be good at people. Pretending. And I'm pretending to be good at maths nor English. I just pretending. And I'm pretending. Yeah. All right, and guys. And I'm pretending to be good at maths nor English. I just pretending to be good at people. Good night, everybody. Good night. I'm pretending to be good. Good, 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 good.